to me this morning um, and also for those who were here very late last night. It doesn't seem that long since I saw you. Um, so um, we have three members on, on Starleaf today. Um, Andrew Muir, Liz Kimmins and Dolores Kelly are also welcome to the meeting. Um, during today's um, meeting we will consider subordinate legislation, we'll have a departmental briefing in relation to PC21 and then a briefing from the Community Transport Association. Um, we don't have any apologies. Um, moving then through to um, Chair's business. Uh, yesterday, um, Chairs and Deputy Chairs were invited to a briefing um, which was organised by CLG in relation to um, common frameworks. And I just really want to seek the, the, the committee's agreement to send a number of questions to the department. I think the, really the, the feeling was across all um, the, the various committees that it would be useful to uh, ask a number of questions, uh, the same type of questions, and then for um, Sean and the team then to sort of collate um, what's going on in the, in the same sort of formula. So if I can just run through the questions very quickly, okay. just to get your agreement. So the questions are as follows. Can the department confirm which frameworks fall within the department's remit, either where the department leads or where it is a cross-cutting policy? Can, can you confirm which of the frameworks identified are legislative or non-legislative? And for each framework, can you provide a list of any legislation, either primary or secondary, required for its implementation? Can you identify to what extent are the provisions of these frameworks subject to the outcome of the negotiations of the UK's future relationship with the EU? For each framework, can you provide a timeline for provision of the summary document, provisional framework and expected implementation date? For each framework, can you set out the nature of the Department's engagement with sector stakeholders and experts, including other devolved legislatures? For each framework, Please provide details on what the current arrangements under EU law in this policy area are, what is the purpose of each framework, what it does, why it's needed and whether it replicates in part or in full EU law policy, what form will the, the framework take, for example a memorandum of understanding or a concordat, and include a reason why it will take this form. So members are content that we will we'll send that through to the department in order to get a um, response. Very comprehensive. Yeah. Members content Great. with that? Great. Okay, thank you. Um, moving then to draft minutes, there at page six, and there for the meeting of the 18th of November. Are members content Great. with that? Okay. Moving then to matters arising, and that's page 12. And again, those are from the meeting of the 18th of November. Do members have any issues in relation to that? Um, I just have one thing I would like to raise, and that's at um, page 16, where we have outstanding committee requests for information. And that's obviously in relation to our consideration last week and the discussions which we had by the examiner of statutory rules regarding um, SR 2020 Planning Act 2011 review regulations. Um, there are obviously time constraints for committee's consideration of um, subordinate legislation, that's 10 day, sitting days of plenary or 30 calendar days. This limit lapsed um, and the, the statutory rule will come into operation today. Now there, there are issues in relation to that for us um, in so much as it, information came to us very late. Now, we have obviously written to the department highlighting our concerns. I'm obviously aware that the examiner's statutory rules has highlighted the same concerns that she spoke to us about. Um, so really, if members are content, it's really just to write again, just to reinforce um, the concerns that we had on the basis of that, um, because this now has come into operation. Um, but I think that it's incumbent on the committee just to underline that we did have concerns, but. We, had, we didn't have, the, have sufficient time in order to address that. So if members are content that we do that, just to make sure that we, we have actually covered ourselves too. Absolutely. Ms Anderson. Separate point. Oh, OK, anybody else on that, that point? So we passed the timeline, so we have no issues, no, no challenges to it. Well, we would have to, we'd have to have had a pray, no, had, no, we'd no, had to pray against, would have had a pray against it, it, which would have required us to have had a motion to the business office last Tuesday. We didn't actually have the information until Wednesday. Wednesday. Mm -hmm. 
we obviously contacted the department and we didn't have anything back in time in order for to be able to do something with regard to that. Well then, Chair, we need obviously um, what protections are then in place for the committee itself? Do you oh, mean, can yeah. we get legal? Do we need? Do we now need to seek legal advice as to where we stand? Because I mean, obviously, we had an opportunity to challenge it through the process because the information arrived late. It's just where we are as a committee on it. Yeah. Firm I think that would be useful to do, but I think you know we have to also reinforce to the department that they are essentially acting at risk because that there yeah. have been there have been concerns raised. There is an opportunity for them to address that, and I suppose what we could also do, if members are content, to um, to say to the department that you know we will assist them through the passage of an amendment to the original piece of legislation to allow that to. Um, to rectify the issues. And, and Chair, us, to, but to say, just to keep ourselves safe no, as a committee, so. to reiterate the point, we got it late because somebody could very well write in this and say, hold on a minute, why does the committee not act? So it's, we have yeah. outlined now yeah. why, what the process is. Okay, thank you. And, and really that came about as, as a part of a conversation that I had yesterday to find out where we were in relation to that and you know the information what hadn't been with us so it was at that stage it was it was too late for us to do anything uh, no no fair enough no I, I... So. okay um another point someone asked Ms. Anderson what point of matters arising yeah well you could direct me as uh, whether I should bring it up here, which is point seven in relation to the taxi drivers' financial assistance. We can maybe do that at correspondence. Okay. Because we have okay. correspondence from taxi drivers, okay. and we also have a response from the minister. So just the next okay. item. No problem. So um, if you're content then with the with all that, um, that has been detailed in matters arising, we'll move on to correspondence. And the memo is at page twenty-seven and tabled at page three. Um, at page 44, we've got the, um, the Ministerial Advisory Panel on Infrastructure. We've got the response from them just in relation to issues which were raised at the committee um, on the 11th of November. Um, we have correspondence um, in relation to the licensing and registration of clubs. Um, page 57, with response um, from the Minister for issues raised on the 4th of November. And we also have um, a tabled at page 7 is the Minister's response to our correspondence um, regarding issues of the 11th of November, and this obviously details the issues in response to the issues that we raised around um, the applications for the um, Taxi Driver mm -hmm. Financial Assistance Scheme and the eligibility criteria. Yeah. And we've also received um, of various correspondence from, these are correspondence from um, individuals who are taxi drivers and their experiences in relation to the scheme. Along with um, Belfast public hire taxis, they've also raised concerns. Um, so, members of um, comments in relation to that. Um, Chair, we all received the uh, the correspondence uh, from someone I think was representing six uh, cross community taxi drivers. Um, I believe they've they've come together to to try to address uh, some of the issues, and they have asked to present. Uh, in front of the committee. I'm conscious not only of the fact that some of you were up to 3 a.m. this morning, but also Friday is a deadline for the scheme to close. And I don't know whether it's possible even for us all, or I hate to put any more pressure on yourself because I know you were here to 3, um, but to try to even get a Zoom or some kind of contact uh, with these individuals and I only just throw that out as one recommendation because the grievance that the taxi drivers have with the scheme, um, uh, those grievances have been raised with myself since the scheme was formulated, particularly the criteria and the eligibility and mainly circulating around the issue of the insurance. I am sure, like, uh, like many of you, I have received correspondence from partners of taxi drivers who, for instance, who are in households with a few children, some of them who are struggling, some of them have special needs, and they had to choose between putting food on the table or paying for their taxi insurance. And some of them actually were shielding, and so there was no way that they were even going to leave their homes. They have said that they had temporarily suspended the insurance for uh, so that they could put food on the table 
and therefore the criteria. And I have had two correspondence from the minister this week in relation to, to this, where the minister talks about having to ensure value for money uh, for each payment, and there has to be continuous taxi insurance for the period of the 22nd of March and the 30th of September. And I don't think that has taken account of the hardship that the taxi drivers were feeling. So my concern is Friday deadline. We may not be able to do anything to turn that around or to ask the minister to at least look at the policy. The, uh, the eligibility criteria is the problem here. And I would ask that we try to take some action to give these taxi drivers a hearing. Okay, um, Ms. Kelly. I can't hear you, Dolores. You're on mute. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. I know it has been an issue, uh, and I can understand why uh, people um, um, people made made difficult choices. I understand that. Um, so. Um, I wonder, is there any information we could, I understand the Minister has been advised by the Audit Office in terms of having to take uh, this particular uh, decision around insurance. Um, maybe we should get some clarification um, in relation to that. Um, I know the Minister's letter is in our table pack and it does set out uh, some of the help that has been available. And of course, this element uh, is only for PPE and some of the overheads. It's not around uh, replacement of income, which uh, is a responsibility both in terms of uh, the economy and indeed communities around uh, welfare payments. And I know that brings cold comfort to people in, in difficult times, but I just wonder, uh, I wouldn't want to give people a false sense of hope whenever really the odds are stacked against them from the audit office point of view and indeed stacked against the minister in doing what she might well wish to do. So perhaps we could have some regard to that. I just don't think it's fair to give people hope when there isn't any. No, I think, uh, no, I, think I appreciate that. But I suppose the thing is that even those who did stop taxing at that particular juncture, for them to get back on the road again, they will have to um, install various precautions in their taxis, so that, that in itself makes it difficult for them to get back to work too. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Boylan. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I support my colleagues' comments. The, the issue for me, obviously, is, and I've been contacted by a number of them, um, the key element now is the time frame, because it closes Friday. We've been submitted a letter there in our PACs requesting a meeting to present to us. And we need to urgently write to the Minister to see can that late deadline be extended to give people a chance to see how we can and to give the other people to present in front of us or some of us, whoever we can. So Ms. Anson uh, suggested a Zoom, I don't know where anybody's up for that, but how, how soon do you think, Chair, we would get an answer back from the Minister where that she can? Is it in the regulations that those time frames are set and can't be changed? Or those are the kind of questions we need to ask. That might be something that we need to explore. Um, the, the clerk will contact the DALO um, after the meeting just to try and get that um, information. I, I'm content, if other members are, to, to try to maybe facilitate a, a Zoom call in the morning or something, or Friday morning. I know maybe, I mean, it'll not really make an awful difference to the timing of this, um, but if you know we feel that it's, it's useful for us to have a, a a sort of a, a conversation. I'm, I'm, con I'm content to do that if other members are. Um, Mr. Muir. Sure, can, can I also propose ask for all the correspondence between the three ministers, finance, economy, and uh, infrastructure in relation to all and any schemes available to taxi drivers? I think it's only fair that we have complete oversight of uh, all of the um, uh, work and effort that has gone into seeking. Um, to uh, come up with something to help uh, this particular uh, industry. Um, so I, I propose that we ask for correspondence between all of the ministers in relation to help for the taxi industry. Would that include communities as well? Yes. Okay. Um, just in relation to having a meeting then, are, are members content that we, we have a Chair. Chair. meeting? Chair. Mr Muir. Sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I would uh, support that, and uh, obviously, 
we need to get full clarity on the insurance issue and if there's any work around in relation to that because it's real hardships has been experienced by taxi drivers and the £1,500 we all know what the purpose of that is to cover overheads but it's really desperately required amount of money and it's the minimum they're really a lot of them need a lot more than that um, but we need to be able to engage and see what the story is and I would support what uh, Dolores Kelly said in terms of the correspondence because we need to see the full package of what's been done to help taxi drivers in the round because there is assistance desperately required. Okay. Mr. Yeah, just a point, as, as, uh, as Anders referred to the dates, 22nd of March to the 30th of September, if a taxi operator or a driver had insurance, and let's say it ran out for argument's sake in the middle of May, and that gentleman or lady decided not to renew it, I would understand clearly. The period, I think, is a bit tight, but you have to have it between those dates. I would see through it if you had insurance and it ran out and you made the decision not to you know, go on because you have no work. You know, so I think the criteria of, of looking at not having it between those dates, of having it ending between those dates and not renewed would be possibly a val valid argument. Mm -hmm. Mr Beggs? Um, I also think it needs to look at, and particularly those who may have simply almost taken a furlough with their insurance, actually... Uh, they had a valid insurance. They, they, they asked that it be deferred for a period until the work would return. And I think it's excessively harsh for those who have had long-term uh, taxi insurance who may have taken a gap because of lack of work, yep. mm -hmm. but still had a live insurance that they could have activated by a phone call, for example, uh, to exclude them from any payment. Uh, I think it's overly harsh and needs, needs looked at again. Mr Hilditch? No, I'm in agreement with you. Okay, I think everyone's general agreement in relation to that, Ms. Anderson. Uh, just one little point, um, because I know everyone's diaries is going to be congested and it'll be difficult, but it, it should be obviously to suit yourself and if, if any of us can join or not, uh, that should be relevant. Uh, that said, you may be able to look that even beyond Friday, because my understanding is that there's legal uh, that they've gone to a solicitor to ask about this scheme because of the very uh, point that Mr. Beggs has raised. So maybe we might want to try to see if we could schedule some of them in uh, to, to present to us on, at the committee as well. Okay, well like, um, Can I just come briefly back? Yes, of course. Uh, I'm just anxious that any um, request to extend the deadline will mean that drivers wouldn't get their money before Christmas. So I think we should let this element of the scheme. Um, this scheme go ahead and then argue about where um, some of the um, difficulties have arisen around insurance. But it seems to be fairly clear. I know um, uh, Stormont and the executives in the news again today about how they've managed public money. So I don't think any of us want to go down that particular road. But at the same time, we don't want to uh, delay the money getting out before Christmas to those who are anxiously waiting on it. And, and that's the difficulty with that extending the deadline. I think that's, that's a very valid yeah. point. Yeah. Uh, but so members mm -hmm. are content that um, that the clerk will liaise with the DALO just in relation to some of the questions that have been asked here today, and that um, some that some conversations are had with some with some of those who have contacted us to see whether or not they would be available for a Zoom call, be that Friday or at the start of next week, um, and an email then will circulate um, for to to give members time. Okay, be content with that. And, and it might be something, depending on how the Zoom call and the information you receive go, that you may come back <coughs> to the clerk to see if we can fit them in maybe the side of Christmas because well, they may want to come and present. I think it would be useful for us. I think it would be useful for us to have that conversation in advance of next Wednesday's committee meeting. Yeah. And then we can make a call in relation to that. At that yeah, just for any chair, it's not so much. Sorry, it's not so much the extension of the deadline because those people are entitled to get their money any because that. The thing is, if if it closes, there may not be any other than the legal challenge. So we just need to find out quickly what the options are. Right? But we we are also assuming that those they will have a, made the app, they will have applied, so their information oh, no, will they're, be they're, in. They're so um, their application that. in that respect should be valid, whether so really, or not they're meeting the criteria as it sits at the moment. Maybe something different. So um, we'd obviously you obviously encourage everyone who who is in that position to put an application in. Then you're on, yeah. um, okay, that's grand. Okay, so... Yeah. Okay. Should um, I agree to ask the correspondence? Yes, I think yeah, we've yeah. agreed to that, and we've also agreed then to um, speak to the DALO in relation to some of the information, that, additional information that we require, 
and we will endeavour to set up a Zoom call with some members of the we, we're not going to be able to speak to everybody, but if we can speak to some a, a few key members of that um, industry that we can um, in advance of next Wednesday's meeting so that we have um, further information at that time to make a, a further call. Okay. Um, other items of correspondence have members any concerns in relation to? I just want to highlight um, correspondence that we've received a tabled at page five from Graham Keady, the managing director of Belfast International Airport, regarding financial impact of COVID on the airport. I spoke with Graham and others on at Monday this week, Tuesday this week, in relation Monday. It's all merging. Um, um, and obviously there's, there's there's real challenges for the international airport um, and he obviously would like to to meet and give us a, a briefing so if members are content that we would schedule um, a, a starleaf meeting in at the start of next week's committee meeting um, with the international airport if you're content to do that great okay thank you uh, Chair, may, maybe to accompany that we might want information from the minister because my understanding Maybe someone correct me if I'm wrong, but there was 10 million set aside for airports. There's been 1.2 million given to uh, Derry City Airport, and I'm not sure what the plan is for the rest. So it would be good yeah, to understand I have a, yeah, actually, what the intention is. I have a priority question on, the, oh, on that actually. Okay. So, okay, hopefully so that we'll might be able to get that, that information. Starleaf meeting, if we had that information. But if we had that information in advance, yeah. would be very useful. Um, uh, there's, sure. there's been, <laughs> Sure, can I just add, I recall, I think it was yesterday or Monday, Minister Murphy made some reference at question time uh, to some of the money that he holds centrally for Aldergrove Airport. So are, are we asking Minister Murphy for his view on it? I think it's held centrally but, for well, our I, I Minister. Th well, I think before we, all, before we all fall out, I think it would be useful maybe to have the conversation um, with the international airport, um, just in really, with regards to the situation that they find themselves in. Um, and whatever action then is required to come out of that meeting, obviously. Yep. Perhaps this may be unnecessary by the time we get to next Wednesday. Something else may have happened because these things are quite fluid. But um, if you're content at this stage just to have that action, that we, we have a, a briefing from Graham and his colleagues. Okay. Okay. Um, we've also received a page 73, a response from um, Logistics UK regarding COVID mitigation and discussions with the department. Um, within that correspondence, there's a request that the committee endorse that such businesses, including those within the haulage and logistics sector, who to date have been excluded from mitigation schemes, have, ac have access to a means tested support scheme and that really harks back to several months ago when we had um, this conversation with um, Logistics UK as they, they were under a previous another name before that and um, the Road Haulage Association so if if members are content that we do write to the department um, in relation to support for hauliers uh, because obviously they were they were included with taxis and um, coach operators and as such they've sort of fallen to the by the by the wayside so yep. if members are content that we do that at this yep absolutely yeah chair, chair, chair i would support that i think it's important to do that because the hauliers are facing financial difficulties and i think it's important that assistance is provided uh, no least one company in my constituency who would be greatly received of any assistance and uh, desperately in need of that so <coughs> thank you okay thank you all agreed <coughs> okay so are members content then the actions are suggested in the memo are also agreed unless um, we have agreed the contrary. Members content? <coughs> okay, moving then to item six, which is um, subordinate legislation, uh, SRs, which are not subject to assembly proceedings. At page 102, SR 2020-240, is the Road Traffic Amendment 2016 Act Commencement um, number two, Order Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 21st of October and we were content. The rule is not subject to assembly resolution. Are members content with this rule? Great. So the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-240, the Road Traffic Amendment 2016 Act Commencement number two, Order Northern Ireland 2020 and has no objection to the rule. At page 106, we have SR 2020-257, 
the Parking Places Disabled Persons Vehicles Amendment No. 2, Order Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the Committee on the 11th of November, and we were content. The rule is not subject to Assembly resolution. Are members content with this rule? That the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020 257, the Parking Places Disabled Persons Vehicles Amendment No. 2, Order Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Great. Page 112 of SR 2020 259, the roads speed limit number two order Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 4th of November 2020, and we were content. The rule is not subject to assembly resolution. Are members content with this rule? Content. That the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020 259, the road speed limit number two order Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Great. At page 118, with SR 2020 260, the road speed limit number three order Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the Committee on the 4th of November 2020 and was content. The rule is not subject to Assembly resolution. Are members content with this rule? Content. content. The Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-260, the road speed limit number 3, order Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Three. Page 124, we have SR 2020-263, the parking places disabled persons vehicles, amendment number 3, order Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the Committee on the 11th of November 2020 and was content. The rule is not subject to Assembly resolution. Are members content with the rule? Content. Okay. The Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-263, the Parking Places Disabled Persons Vehicles Amendment No. 3, Order Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Great. At page 130, we have SR 2020-264, the Parking and Waiting Restrictions, Drumore Order Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the Committee on the 4th of November 2020 and was content. The rule is not subject to Assembly resolution. That the, are you content with the rule? Mm -hmm. okay. the, that the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-264, the parking and waiting restrictions, from more order in Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Eight. At page 138, SR 2020-266, the road speed limit number four order in Northern Ireland 2020, the proposal for the rule was considered by the Committee on the 4th of November 2020, and was content. The rule is not subject to assembly resolution. Are members content with this rule? Content. Okay. That the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-266, the roads speed limit number four order Northern Ireland 2020 and has no objection to the rule. Okay. At page 142, SR 2020-270, the parking places disabled persons vehicles amendment number four order Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the committee on the 11th of November 2020 and was content. The rule is not subject to assembly resolution. Are members content with this rule? And. That the committee for infrastructure um, has considered SR 2020-270, parking places, disabled persons, vehicles, amendment number four, order in Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Please. Item seven, SR 2020-252, the regulations EC number 1370-2007, um, Public Service Obligations and Transport Amendment EU Exit Northern Ireland Regulations 2020. The committee considered the rule for pro proposal for the rule on the 23rd of September and was content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Content. That the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-252, um, the regulation EC number 1370-2007, Public Services Obligations and Transport Amendment EU Exit Northern Ireland Regulations 2020 and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules has no objection to the rule. Great. Item 8, um, SR 2020-258, um, the Killy Valley Road Garva Abandonment Order Northern Ireland 2020, it's page 160. The committee considered the proposal for the rule on the 4th of November 
and was content the rule is subject to negative resolution. There's been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Content. That the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-258, the Killy Valley Road, Garva, Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Um, item 9, SR 2020-265, um, the Seagull Industrial Estate, uh, Craig Avon Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and that's at page 168. The committee considered the proposal for the rule on the 4th of November 2020 and was content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Content. That the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-265, the Seago Industrial Estate, Craig Avon Abandonment Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner's statutory rules, there's no objection to the rule. Great. Item 10, SR 2020-271, the Mount Pleasant, Townhill Road, Portland Known Stopping Up Order, Northern Ireland 2020, at page 177. The committee considered the proposal for the rule on the 14th of October 2020 and was content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Content. That the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-271, the Mount Pleasant, Townhill Road, Portland Known Stopping Up Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner's statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Agreed. And finally, SR 2020-273, the A26, Crankhill Road, Central Reservation, Ballymena Stopping Up Order, 2020, and that's at page 184. The committee considered the proposal for the rule on the 14th of October 2020 and was content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Content. That the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-273, the A26 Crankhill Road, Central Reservation, Palomino Stopping Up Order 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules, has no objection to the rule. Great. Thank you very much for that. Um, I've just received, <laughs> I've just received um, an update where, which you might find helpful just with regards to the taxi scheme. Um, the criteria is based in legislation. The closing date is administrative, and I understand at this stage that approximately 5,000 applications um, have been received for um, this scheme. So that's really for, for members' information at this stage, and to bear that in mind. Okay. 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 So, moving on to item 12, and we're having a departmental briefing on PC 21. Um, you'll find um, the briefing paper um, from the department at page 192. Just advise members that um, Hansard will record this session. Um, we're going to welcome um, Linda McHugh, who's the Deputy Secretary of um, Resources, Governance and EU Group. And we also have Damien Curran, who is the Acting Director of Water and Drainage Policy Division. You're both very welcome to the committee this morning. Thank you very it's much. It's good to see you. Um, if you would like to start off with um, a presentation and members will um, follow yep. up with some questions. So thank you very much. Okay, so thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to brief the committee in relation to Price Control 21, um, which is the process for, water and, uh, for the water and sewage services sector in Northern Ireland, commonly known as PC 21. And I'm aware that you've already received as a committee briefing from Northern Ireland Water and the Utility Regulator um, on this subject. And so I'd like to build on that, that, both that briefing and then the written briefing that we've provided to you um, as a department. And in particular, um, I'd like to focus on the department's role in the process um, and the importance of um, the social environmental guidance that the committee agreed for this price control. And then I'm going to hand over to my colleague Damien, who will cover um, the step change required in funding um, for water and sewage services um, as advocated in PC21. So I, I want to start by stressing the department's support for the regulatory price control process. The regulator provides a scrutiny and challenge role, and the benefits of this process are clear. Since becoming a regulated company in 2007, 
Northern Water has achieved impressive results in terms of improved service and efficiency. Northern Water is today providing a much improved service to many more customers, has reduced its operating costs by around 65 million in real terms compared to the old water service, and has closed the efficiency gap with leading water companies in England and Wales to just 8% today, um, really delivering more, better with, with less, um, and I think that's to be commended. In terms of, of PC21, the starting, process, or the starting point for the process was the Minister's social environmental guidance, which was agreed by the executive and issued to the utility regulator. This was developed in partnership with Northern Water and all of its statutory regulators, so not just the utility regulator, but the Northern Environment Agency, the Drinking Water Inspectorate and the Consumer Council as well. Um, and it sets the policy context and direction for Northern Ireland Water's investment priorities over the six-year price control period. The guidance built on the Executive Strategy for Sustainable Water Long-Term Water Strategy for Northern Ireland, which runs from 2015 to 2040. This strategy considers the legal obligations governing water management in Northern Ireland and focuses on priority, priorities in relation to drinking water supply and demand, flood risk management and drainage, environmental protection and improvement, and water and sewage services. And all of those are highly relevant for the price control process. So the social environmental guidance sets the priorities for Northern Ireland water to ensure it meets environmental obligations, including drinking water quality, wastewater quality, and the reduction of pollution. It also advocates improvements in service delivery, sustainability, and adaptation to climate change, all while continuing to drive through ever greater efficiencies. The committee will be aware from the briefing paper that we provided of some of the significant issues facing our water and sewage services. In particular, in the development of the PC21 business plan, Northern Water had advised the department that the wastewater network and treatment system is significantly overstretched. This fact was acknowledged in New Decade, New Approach, which commits to urgent investment in wastewater infrastructure, including specifically the Living with Water programme. Um, as you'll be aware from the briefing from my colleagues last week, the Living with Water programme is a major element of PC21 and critical to addressing the wastewater and drainage constraints affecting the Greater Belfast area. As you heard last week, this programme is a, is a great example of cross-sectoral collaborative working where we seek to create sustainable integrated solutions rather than, than rely wholly on traditional engineering. And this approach has now been rolled out to other areas. In terms of the scale of the wastewater capacity issues, um, there are around 116 areas in Northern Ireland facing limited or no wastewater capacity. The plan sets set out in the draft determination, if fully funded, will address around 49 of those areas and it will take several price controls to fully catch up with years of underinvestment. The regulator published its draft determination for consultation at the end of September this year, and that was an important step in the regulatory process. Northern Water is possibly unique as a public body in that its plans are forensically scrutinized by an expert independent body, and this process provides the department and indeed the wider executive with an added level of independent assurance in terms of Northern Water's funding requirements. There is much common ground between the regulator and Northern Water at this point in the process, with the regulator broadly in agreement with the investment requirement, the draft determination calling for a capital investment of around £2 billion in real terms over the six-year price control period, as opposed to Northern Water's estimate in its business plan of £2.2 billion. Um, sorry, did I see two, two billion? I did, yes, did. sorry. <laughs> in case it was million, it's billion. Um, in terms of operational costs and the provision for resource Dell, the PC21 draft determination calls for the department to provide around 700 million between 2021 and 27, while Northern Ireland Water states that it will require <coughs> near 700, 760 million. Um, now, those figures might differ slightly from the published figures because our budgeting terms, we are required to add in inflation, um, whereas in the draft determination, all the figures are at, at t today's current prices. So that's, that explains that there's a slight differential. Um, but over the next um, months, um, clearly there, there will be 
uh, a bit more negotiation to, to reach the final determination, and we expect it to be somewhere um, between the, the ranges that I've, I've outlined um, when it's final. Um, security and certainty of, of funding is critical to enabling the most efficient delivery of capital projects and, delivery, um, and delivering the services that people deserve. Um, I'm going to now pass over to my colleague Damien, who will cover um, the funding matter in a bit more detail. Well, thank you, Linda. Um, well, thank you, Chair. I'd like to provide the committee with just some further detail in terms of the Department's funding of water and sewage services within the price control process. Um, as an NDPP, and under the sponsorship of DFI, Northern Ireland Water is largely dependent on the Department for budget allocation and for access to borrowing. Uh, it's well known water and sewage infrastructure has been affected by historic underinvestment. Uh, for example, in PC15, the current price control, uh, Northern Ireland Water had initially requested investment cover of £1.7 billion capital budget. However, following the price control process ahead of PC15, the utility regulator determined on a price control of £990 million, uh, and the Department has only been able to provide around £945 million of uh, that amount, a shortfall of about £45 million. And then add to that a process of annual budget, budget settlements, uh, which means that Northern Ireland Water has only single-year budget certainty to work within, uh, and that's created a system where planning is limited, uh, efficiency is curtailed, uh, and delivery is slowed. Um, PC21 represents a step change in the funding requirement, uh, with the draft determination of £2 billion representing over a 100% uplift. In terms of options for funding, uh, for providing this funding, uh, as previously stated, Northern Ireland Water is dependent on budget allocation from the Department and from the wider executive. Um, the budget requirement is submitted as part of the Department's total budget bid through the Department, through the Department of Finance uh, and onwards to the Executive for voting. Northern Ireland Water's uplift in capital budget in PC21 is significant from 21-22 onwards. For example, Northern Ireland Water's baseline capital allocation in 2021 was £150 million. From 21-22, the PC21 draft determination recommends an allocation of around £220 million. This requirement increases as the PC21 delivery programme gathers pace to reach the total of £2 billion over the six years. It should be noted that the PC21 draft determination does not make any allowance for any longer-term financial impact of the current COVID pandemic, and also no allowance for the current shift in many working practices, uh, with a lot of us uh, working from home uh, and corresponding impact on on the domestic water supplies. Uh, it also does not make any uh, allowances for the potential for cost fluctuation or additional operating costs as a result of the EU exit, uh, both of which are risks. Uh, we are also aware that the Northern Ireland Environment Agency is planning to introduce more stringent environmental standards and procedures, which may introduce a greater risk of failing compliance and more frequent prosecution, which will only increase the pressure to adequately fund Northern Ireland Water. To expand further on Northern Ireland Water's funding dependency, uh, the company avails of borrowing exclusively from the Department for Infrastructure. Access to borrowing is essential for Northern Ireland Water to deliver its capital programme, uh, but spending of borrowed funds is limited by public expenditure levels. And while Northern Ireland Water's company may have sufficient headroom to justify access to additional borrowing, this must come with the corresponding budget cover to be of any use to allow them to spend it. Um, other sources of funding have been explored, uh, but need to be carefully considered for a number of reasons. For example, the financial transactions capital, uh, that's generally only available to entities within the private sector. Um, EU investment bank loans, for example, uh, are not likely to be available following the EU exit. Uh, market borrowing or bond finance uh, is not an option given Northern Water status as an NDPB and reliance on government subsidy for much of its revenue. Uh, the reinvestment and reform initiative, or RRI borrowing facility, uh, that could provide additional capital funding and budget to the executive, and if utilised for the water sector, could go away to addressing the funding gap. 
However, the RRI facility does come with an additional cost to the executive in the form of interest repayments. And also, you would imagine there would be competition right across the board in terms of uh, competition and access to RRI borrowing, and that would be a decision for the executive to take. Um, the option of changing Northern Water status to access alternative sources of funding was also explored. Looking at how other water companies are funded across Great Britain and Ireland. Uh, but this work really concluded that changes would not be possible without a shift in, in domestic charging policy. Uh, our Minister has been clear in stating that she will not oversee the imposition of domestic water charges. And this is a policy that has been endorsed by the First Minister and Deputy First Minister and agreed by the Executive. Uh, just in conclusion, uh, the utility regulator's draft determination sets out the size and scale of investment required for Northern Ireland Water to meet its statutory and regulatory obligations and start addressing historic capacity issues. Uh, the benefits of this investment are cross-sectoral in that improvements in water and sewage infrastructure benefit the economy, environment, public health and make positive moves towards addressing climate change. Uh, the Minister has received letters of support from Minister Poots, Minister Weir, Minister Long, Minister Swan, Minister Dodds, and acknowledging the importance of investing in water and sewage services. Our Minister has also had a number of discussions and correspondence with Minister Murphy and the wider executive on the subject of funding water and sewage services. Uh, the funding challenges is great, but the consequences of not funding this price control are even greater, with a deterioration in environmental standards and service levels and ever-growing constraints to economic growth. Our Minister has made it clear that water and sewage services are fundamental to our green recovery and rebuilding the economy post-COVID, and this requires investment. Chair Linda and I thank you and the Committee's time for giving you this briefing uh, and would welcome any questions. Okay, thank you. I think probably all united in the view, obviously, that investment is, is key to all of this, and, mm -hmm. and thank you very much for your, your, your detailed presentation. Um, the challenge, I suppose, if you look at it, this on paper, is the fact that the last um, um, price control um, period you fell short, and that was for 990 million, and now we're looking at in excess, really, of two billion pounds, because it's not just with what the utility regulator is recommending, but you've also highlighted the challenges in relation um, to, to COVID and obviously issues, perhaps in relation to, to Brexit as well. So, really, how are we going to, to square this circle um, with um, the other challenges that we have with regards to how the budget is set, uh, and also around the status of? Of Northern Ireland Water, um, and, I, and I do appreciate that you know, you've, you've, you've explored various options, and it very much is a political decision. But are there other options to look at this in a way that doesn't perhaps include um, domestic charging, or, or has that really been bottomed out as, as an option? Well, if I take the first part, and then maybe Damien can can um, talk to you about some of the work that, that he led uh, quite recently on, on looking at what alternatives might be. Um, so you're absolutely right. There is a huge challenge um, for the executive at this point in time, and you know we are all clear that uh, that this is only one of many competing priorities for what will be a limited budget. Um, we await with bated breath what the Chancellor of the Exchequer is going to announce later on today in terms of um, the funding envelope for Northern Ireland. Um, we had been hoping um, at one point for a three-year comprehensive spending review, but as you're aware, it's now just one year. Um, that is not helpful, but I think we can all understand the position that, that the government's in at the moment um, in terms of not being able to commit to three years. Um, but once we know what the, um, the, the funding for the Northern Ireland block is going to be, um, you know, it'll be a matter for the executive in terms of how they are going to prioritise, but, but we're fully aware that we are only one of quite a number of um, serious pressures on that budget. Um, in terms of, of alternatives, um, I mean, Damien, do you want to, to run through some of the work that was done? Certainly, yeah. Um, well, well, the committee will be aware Northern Water is a, a non-departmental public body. Um, its classification as a non-departmental public body was is from 2010. Uh, Northern Water was originally set up as a, as a government-owned company. It was set up at that time. Um, 
whenever the, uh, uh, the policy direction was to introduce domestic water charging. Clearly, that didn't happen. Um, government sub subsidy persisted. Northern Water receives around about 70% of its revenue through government subsidy. Uh, and just that uh, presence, that practice, um, classified Northern Water as an NDBV uh, because of its, its reliance. Uh, an NDBV status brings with it a, you know, a governance regime, got, brings with it responsibilities for uh, the department and for the minister in terms of being answerable to Northern Water, uh, for, for Northern Water to, to, to the executive, to the assembly. Um, in terms of how we can flex that, really it's, 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 it does start with policy. It does start with policy in terms of how Northern Water is funded. Uh, we have looked at other models, as I said, across uh, Great Britain and Ireland. Um, sometimes Welsh Water is, is, is brought up as a company. Um, that, that's a good example. It's, it's a company that's, it is a company, uh, but it's run along mutual lines in terms of it, it doesn't pay a shareholder. Um, it reinvests all of its profit back into uh, you know, services for, for customers. Uh, but, and it does access a uh, bond market for, for, for financing. Um, so it's able to achieve a lot through that. Uh, however, it does follow a practice of, of full water charging. Uh, equally, Scottish Water sometimes flag, flagged up as, a, as another example. Uh, it's owned by the Scottish Government. Uh, it's, it's a public corporation. It borrows from the Scottish Government, I guess, much the same as what Northern Ireland Water does with, uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, however, it also follows a, a, a Scottish Water also follows a policy of, of full water charging. Uh, so it receives um, the vast majority of its revenue um, through, through payment for, for, for services. Um, so it's that sort of notion of where does the revenue come from, who, who pays for, 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 the, for the services, that then triggers uh, the status of an organisation within government, and then that status of that organisation brings with it all of the rules that you would expect government to, to, to have whenever it's trying to have oversight of how public money is, is used and spent. And have any international models been looked at, or has it very much been sort of localised around the, uh, the UK regions? Well, I think Northern Ireland is, is probably unique, certainly within Europe, probably throughout much of the world, in terms of um, having a, a, a model that is subsidised um, by, by government still, um, where universal domestic charging hasn't been uh, ruled out. Um, so it's, uh, it's that sort of uni uniqueness, if you like, you know, whatever you try to compare it against other models, um, yeah. globally or even uh, locally. Yeah, I, th I think we were unique yeah, until um, the Republic of Ireland um, rolled back on its decision to introduce domestic charging. So I think now in the island of Ireland, certainly in the EU, we are unique. Um, there's no other country in the EU um, that doesn't have domestic charging, as we were reminded by the, the European Commission um, at one point. Um, but as I said, you know, the, the, the uh, policy on domestic charging is absolutely a policy for the executive. and. Um, they are clear that, that there will be no introduction of domestic charging. Um, I suppose most of our constituencies will have been affected by uh, a moratorium of types in, in relation to wastewater treatment, so and hence um, limited development um, mm. as a consequence of, of the capacity there. Um, I am curious just um, with regards to how quickly funds are then released to Northern Ireland Water when there is a situation perhaps where planning has been agreed, um, land acquisition is in place as well in order for then um, projects then to commence. I'm very mindful of one where I live, so um, <laughs> that's, that's ready to go. But really just from just to see what the processes are with regards to Northern Ireland Water in the department in order to, to release funds for those projects and how quickly um, we can expect um, those to, to begin. Yeah. Well... I suppose the prioritisation of investment is actually something that, that the regulator would look at too. Um, and, and in terms of prioritisation, I have to say that, that the, the first priority has to be areas where either the treatment works or the, or, or the wastewater system is currently in non-compliance um, and where they're um, you know, at risk of being either taken to court or have been taken to court and told to fix it. Um, so those really have to be the, the first priorities. Um, and then you know, the regulator will look um, at uh, other areas where you know th there'll be a geographic spread. Um, so you know it's not a case that um, 
the min our minister sits and determines which, which wastewater treatment is going to be um, done next. It's, it's all set out um, in terms of, of outputs um, and agreed through the, the regulatory process. So, this um, is, so there's an ongoing then discussion throughout this then with um, the regulator and obviously um, DOF as well would be involved in this process, would they, with regards to budget allocation? Um, DOF would be involved in, in uh, uh, clearly agreeing the budget that we are given to provide to Northern Ireland Water, but they don't get involved in individual decisions. Um, that would be really for, for the regulator and, and NIEA um, as the regulatory body for wastewater in terms of, of where the priority should lie um, for, for investment in wastewater treatment. Yeah, I suppose as you'd appreciate when, once, um, other, once developers see that an application <coughs> then coming in from Northern Ireland Water that <coughs> then is going through a process, then yeah. there's, a, there's an expectation um, that then that, that application will then sort of see through then reasonably quickly in order to um, allow development to commence. Yes. And, and you know, I know Northern Ireland Water is, is clearly concerned that... Um, their current capacity issues are, are stymied in development. Um, they're working increasingly with developers to see if, if they can come up with innovative solutions to, to allow development to continue without compromising environmental standards and, and getting them into non-compliance and therefore you know, fines and then further undermining their, their financial position um, and also their reputation. Um, so depending on, on the size and scale of the development and, and where it is in the topography, you know, we're looking at sustainable drainage, whether you know, significant amounts of rainwater can be taken out of the system to allow room for the wastewater element of what needs to come off a new development. So you know, replacing one with the other to allow for capacity. Um, and that can be possible in some areas, but not in all. Um, so you know, Northern Water are really trying to um, to look innovatively at how they can still operate and allow development, as I said, without compromising um, their environmental standards and, 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 in fact, their environmental obligations as a company. Well, thank you. Um, Mr Hildage, Deputy Chair. Thanks, Chair. Some of the questions have actually been answered there and very, very well explained. Thank you. Um, one area which I was interested in, that the Chair and myself met the CEO on the finance officer of uh, NI Water mm -hmm. probably six months ago, I think. Mm -hmm. And at that stage, there, there was a big fear of the loss from COVID. Mm -hmm. due to businesses, and I think you touched upon it, Damien, people working out from home and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Is there any estimation as to how extensive those losses are going to be now that we're maybe six months down the road? From yeah, I mean, I suppose it is hard to know once, for example, you know, we get a, um, a vaccination and whether or not we're all going to just revert to, to, to normal or whether actually um, working from home is going to be... Well, that, that's my fear, that yeah. it, becomes a, it becomes a thing, really. Yeah, and working from home, you know... Companies it, will see the benefits of folk working from home. Yeah. Or maybe give them an additional income to yeah. work from home. Yeah, yeah. And reduce their cost. Yeah. yeah. So... You know, I, th I think actually that the regulator has looked at this, and I, I think I think they've, they've estimated maybe a an eight to nine percent shift in <coughs> non-domestic to domestic use, which clearly is going to be a reduction in in, in income from from um, non-domestic paying customers. Um, but it's it's a bit finger in the air, um, and you know we, we will have to look to see if the long-term um, impact of COVID is actually going to last longer. Um, and be permanent. You're this hand looking for money and just disappearing on the other side. Yeah. And certainly there was fear six months ago. Yeah. No, and, and certainly, you know, in, at the height of, of restrictions, you know, in the last summer, um, there was a, a, a marked shift. In fact, you know, um, non domestic. Um, use had plummeted, but actually we were using a lot more water overall because people were at home, um, people were getting bored, you know, children were filling very large swimming pools, and, and then we had the heat wave, which didn't help. Um, so, you know, it, it, uh, water in gardens, power hosing, you know, it, it all uses a huge amount of water. Um, and so, you know, Northern Water were in a difficult position because they lost income, but actually had to provide even more water than normal. 
Um, and we were very grateful that the executive actually recognised that and um, provided additional funding from COVID bids to meet the shortfall in income that Northern Ireland Water had, had experienced during that time. The, just another point to add on that. that there really is no access for borrowing to invest in. It, it's tied up in, a, in some sort of legislation that they're not allowed to borrow from outside other than government. Mm -hmm. So as a government organisation, yeah, uh, they, they have to borrow through uh, through the department. Um, as I said, it, it's this notion of the status of no and water as, as an NDBB that really uh, brings with it this phalanx of rules uh, in terms of what it can and can't do. Um, it's something that um, we have explored, um, uh, but. Uh, there, there's just this block. Once you get to that, right? What is Northern Ireland Water? It's an NTBB, right? It goes that direction instead of the other direction. Um, so th there is, as I said, the, the notion of the RRI borrowing. Um, but I, I totally understand that's a, that's an executive matter. That's uh, something that needs to be uh, carefully picked through to see if that's something the executive would uh, be willing to avail of. Out of the chair you said you had potentially maybe looked outside of the devolved institutions in the UK and uh, just to add look myself there. Finland had a world has a world class uh, set up uh, but it's got a two fold. It's provided jointly by private and uh, government. But it, it sort of held up as one of the practices in Europe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. made it a world class service, you know, right. so I don't know right. how we can learn from that. No, definitely, I'll, I'll take a note of that, thank you. Yeah, we're always keen to learn, um, so... Don't be nice with that in the winter. <laughs> okay, you. thank Cheers. you, Mr Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and you're very welcome. Thank, thank you very you. much for the uh, presentation. Just, Linda, you talked about the, the Live um, with Water programme. I take it it's a priority, in the, one of the priorities in the PC21? Yes, it, it will be if if PC twenty one gets fully funded, and that's the caveat. You know, if if it doesn't get fully funded, then I think we're all going to have a job of work to do to figure out where in the prioritisation list that sits, and can elements of it be done um, and not others? You know, because the, the the bill for it, as you know, is is what four hundred and fifty. You no, know, I'm just looking at the recent figures now, and that's what it, that's why I asked because it's a quarter of the budget. If if you yeah. got the budget, you yeah. know. And then there's another four or hundred million spent at the minute to the department. Yeah. Through, yeah. And you know, that five hundred a quarter is more now because of COVID and other things. Yeah. I mean, it it would be it might be more than a quarter of the budget, or is, it, is that roughly the figure we're looking at? That's what we're working on at yeah. the minute. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Northern Ireland Water's limit with water bill is, is is will be about five hundred million over the six year Quarters. price control. Yeah. Uh, the department is seeking hundred million to take forward yeah. uh, projects alongside that yeah. as well. Yeah. This is, I mean, uh, like I say, it's, it's, you know, it's a big it's a big part of the budget. Quarter. It's, it's a big part of the budget. I mean, I have to say that. And, the, and that's saying it doesn't need to be yeah, done. I'm no, no. And and you know the the, the the population equivalent capacity um, that the Living Water Program will um, target is around a third of the, the total population, population equivalent in terms of wastewater treatment. Um, so, you know, the area might not necessarily have a third of the population, but because a lot of people come into Belfast to work or to visit or to shop, you know, um, it, it's about a third of the wastewater treatment capacity that no land water needs to undertake in any one year. So. You know, I, th I think that's why the, the, there's a focus on it. But clearly, um, you know, as we're well aware, those 116 areas are throughout you know, the, 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 whole of, the whole of the north. And you know, um, it's not to say that, that there isn't going to be money spent on those other areas either, um, yeah. because there will have to be a, a spread. But the chair made her play earlier on for her own area. I'm not, I'm not going <laughs> to yeah. delve into that today. Uh, just a, a wee interesting point, because Damien you mentioned NAEA as part of your presentation. I mean, you see in terms of the European directives, and it, it plays a key part now, because I, I don't know where you missed a trick, but in terms of any directive that comes through, like say the wastewater, mm. waste, uh, the water framework directive or the wastewater, any of those directives, we missed the trick in terms of support from Europe, in terms of funding packages. We can't borrow now because we're out, working mm -hmm. out now. And I mean, we, we could have had opportunities because those directives were saying, and it's not that we didn't agree or didn't agree with them, 
the point was that substantial funding is needed now. Yes. And you know the question is, I mean, how does that play a role for us? Did, did, I'm sure we've got some funding of some measure down through the years. Yeah, I mean, the, where are we now in our final programme? Yeah, the, yeah well, there was actually quite a significant um, chunk of funding provided through Interreg um, for two programmes. So, um, Source to Tap, um, which is around sustainable catchment area management planning, um, and then the Swell project, which was to look at improving the water quality in both um, Loch Foyle and Carlingford Loch. Um, and those are clearly joint um, projects with, with Irish Water and, and other community and, and council areas um, along, along the, the, the border areas. Um, and we um, have been working uh, with um, DERA, uh, SEUP, SEUPB and the Department of Finance um, to ensure that Peace Plus also would include an element of, of um, uh, work for our support for water quality work because there, there's more to be done and we've identified quite a number of innovative projects that we think would fit within the environmental and sustainability um, part of um, Peace Plus. So that work's continuing. Um, just obviously NAW is a big user of electric. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering in terms of our efforts to decarbonise. I mean, what have you, what's in the PC21 to, to address that issue in terms of decarbonisation? Yeah, um, well, Northern Ireland Water is ambitious on that front, very much so. Um, uh, they have a range of policy proposals in terms of uh, trying to decarbonise the organisation, reduce its burden on or its, its, its reliance on traditional sources of electricity. Um, it's got uh, measures in it to increase solar, wind, um, as, uh, as a potential um, for, for electricity generation. Um, just recently there, Northern Water was allocated around five million um, funding from um, the Department for Economy to take forward a, a hydrogen electrolyzer project um, that will produce both hydrogen and oxygen. And Northern Water will use the oxygen to reduce uh, at a wastewater treatment works to reduce the, uh, uh, the, the burden on, on, on electricity usage at that. Um, so there are a, a, a range of different measures that the company is uh, following and, and really, really ambitious to try and get after uh, to, to make uh, inroads into the, into the, and, and really play its part in terms of the climate challenge. Um, tree planting is, a, is another one. Um, we're not on what are seeking to, to work with DERA and other organisations to use its, uh, its land mass. It's, uh, it's, it's, I think it's the second largest uh, Landowner in, in Northern Ireland, and it's, uh, it wants to exploit that uh, in terms of planting trees and uh, and, and further offset um, the carbon. Uh, in fact, I think today they're they're announcing with with um, Dara and and uh, our minister that they're they're planning to plant a million trees in the coming years um, to, to offset some of their carbon um, mm -hmm. and improve the environment. Yeah, and just, just two quick points to finish. Um, say in terms of, obviously, member states are able to do programmes there together through European funding. Mm -hmm. Is that avenue now, I'm talking about from an island point of view, is that avenue now close to us in terms of some of these programmes? Um, well, there is the, the, the Peace Plus that uh, Linda referred to, so that's like sort of the, the next stage or the replacement stage, if you like, in terms of um, trying to further these projects, the source that's happened as well. Um, so those are proposals that we're currently working with with DARE on um, to uh, you know, make beneficial use from uh, funding from that front. Uh, we need to see what comes out further in terms of um, the EU exit and the replacement uh, sources of funding um, that the, the UK government will provide um, uh, UK wide. So that's uh, that's something we'll need to manage. And, and also whether you know in, in any deal that may be done. Um, there is continued access to other elements of, of EU, say R and D funding or innovation funding or environmental funding. Um, that will all that's all part and parcel of the negotiations. So. Okay, just quickly in terms of climate change and flooding, how does the PC twenty one tackle some of those issues? Yeah, well again, the uh, the flooding aspect is uh, yeah, we have flood uh, risk management plans that are currently being developed. Um, they'll be released for consultation out in, uh, at the end of December, um, and that will lead for a year's consultation where 
um, you know, sectors will uh, uh, reply to that and, and manage um, what that means and, and before issuing uh, in uh, uh, finalisation in December next year. Um, the climate change mapping and modelling uh, 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 and looking at the impacts of, of climate change, they, they will form part of that. Um, we need to be conscious of that. Uh, in terms of flood risk, um, the, the other parts of the department in terms of are, are, are modelling that in terms of building um, climate change mapping and, uh, uh, and the impact of climate change. Uh, looking forward, for example, uh, floodplains and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, and the like. So that's it's it's all sort of in the round yeah. of being. Yeah. If we can get them a in conversation. And, and yeah. a lot of that preliminary work actually fed into um, the the price control process, um, and would be articulated then. I mean, I think that's another reason why there's such a focus at this time around on on the wastewater because it's the wastewater side of the business that is more likely to cause flooding um, than anything else without a stir flooding, which is probably the worst kind. It's bad enough getting water in your house, but if it's mixed with raw sewage, it's even worse. Um, so, you know, a lot of those, um, a lot of the plans for the wastewater upgrades will include um, mitigation, the mitigation of, of flooding. Um, and I think Northern Water has done an, an awful lot more work on, on drainage area planning, um, extending that out not only to look at the capacity of the drains, but also to look at um, surface water flooding. Um, and that, I think, has been the, the big change in um, the flood risk management plans this time around. We've, we've focused a lot more on surface water, um, and therefore you know, there's more of a focus, I think, on, on what Northern Water needs to do in urban areas to, to, to start to address um, flood risk. Um, and we're well aware, actually, because of climate change, that that flood risk is increasing. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, just, just one question, because a lot of the issues have already been covered by um, other members of the committee. Um, within the documentation that's been sent through to us, it said that the draft determination makes no alliance for the costs associated with Brexit or COVID-19. Now, the issue of COVID-19, we've discussed something around that, but there will be costs associated with Brexit and um, the Chief Executive of Northern Ireland Water wrote to us recently outlining the potential costs around that. I just wanted to see, is there any outline idea of what those costs will be that will have to be concluded in the final determination? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the regulator is well aware that, that this might need to be something that they'll come back to before they finalise the determination. But at this point in time, and before we know what the outcome of negotiations is going to be, it's very difficult to actually be accurate as to how much costs might increase. Um, I mean, some some potential um, increases could be because of additional tariffs or delays in, in delivery or, you know, additional procedures that have to be gone through. Um, but at this point in time, without knowing the outcome of the negotiation, it's very difficult to put a figure on it. Um, now, we will know clearly by the end of, of December what the position is um, and, you know, may be able to be a bit, uh, a bit more accurate before the the, um, uh, the determination is finalised in March. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, um, Ms. Anderson. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to to Linda and Damien for your presentation and the information you sent. And I'm very happy to hear about the coordination that's taking place between the Department for Infrastructure and DERA with regard to the planting of trees. So it's in that same vein that I would like to ask a question with regards to the kind of coordination that is taking place between your department and the Department of Communities. We heard, for instance, from the Department of Communities, the Minister's housing statement, which was received and welcomed by all, that she is reintroducing ring fence housing for areas, my own constituency, Derry, uh, North and West Belfast. So given the sewage capacity, again, mm -hmm. in, in, in my own constituency and others in Belfast, obviously a new decade, new approach has been referenced, and thankfully Derry is also now going into to that particular programme, or parts of it. What kind of coordination is taking place between the Department of Infrastructure and the Department of Economy to ensure that new housing estates and new houses that would be much needed houses yeah. uh, and homes in Derry um, would be able to proceed because at this moment in time we know that sewage capacity is preventing some developments uh, in the city? 
I mean, certainly from, from my own minister's perspe perspective, this is something that is really concerning her too. You know, she's committed to ensuring and doing everything she can um, to promote social housing, housing in general and social housing in particular. Um, I mean, we are have both departments, had, yeah. sorry for cutting across you, are both departments coordinating in the same way? Thankfully, we've heard the, yeah. the news today about yeah. the planting of the trees. Like, so, so um, are there plans of food yeah. uh, for both departments to sit down to work this out as to yeah. how this can be taken? We, we have had a number of um, meetings with the Department for Communities, um, their, their housing team, um, certainly in, in terms of development of their housing strategy. Um, where you know we've gone through um, the constraints that Northern Water is currently under, um, but I suppose it's one of those intractable problems. You know, the Department of Communities can see where housing is needed, and we see where housing is needed, and we see the, in the level of investment that will be required to provide the services that that will be needed to to, to make those houses um, possible, um, and it comes down to to the money. You know, this needs financed, um, and there's no there's no getting around that. But uh, you know, I absolutely take your point that there's no point in, in one department saying we are going to be doing this, and then another department not being able to provide the, the level of service um, in terms of water and wastewater that, that is required to get that built. So I think it would be helpful for this committee to get some readout of those meetings as to how they will be yeah. taken forward. In relation, again, and uh, to some of the um, information you imparted to us, can I ask you, when you're talking about environmental standards and the EU um, SWELL programme mm -hmm. for, um, for water quality, my own constituency again, and FOIL, River FOIL, and, and, and others, mm -hmm. areas that benefited from that, does NI Water Discharge raw sewage into into rivers, um, given that countries are legally obliged to mm -hmm. to treat sewage before it is released into into the waterways. So I'm looking to know the scale of pollution that could potentially be taking place. Yeah, um, certainly it, it it doesn't do it unless it's absolutely essential, and that would only be at times of very heavy rain, where you know you could you could never build um, a sewage pipe big enough to take some of the really really heavy rain. So um, at times when it, when it's really heavy, um, there is actually an allowance um, that that there are intermittent discharges. Um, it, it helps, I suppose, that when it's heavy rain, it's also diluted. It's not ideal, but I mean every water company has these, and and that's the way the system works. However. There is such a thing as unacceptable intermittent discharges, mm -hmm. where the, the, the sewage system is at capacity, and therefore the discharges are more frequent than they really should be. Um, and at times, it becomes more the norm than the exception because of very heavy rain. Um, so that those un unacceptable intermittent discharges will be one of the priorities set out in the draft determination and the final determination in terms of of where wastewater um, investment needs to go. Can we get information, Chair, um, in relation to what has been um, exceptional circumstances that it has been used and how many times it's been used that hasn't been exceptional but because of um, a lack of capacity? Yeah, well, we can, we can get as much information as, as we can. Um, sometimes, unless it's continually monitored, it's not known. Um, but we can, uh, you know, we can it's ask... not reported in if this is done? Um, they, they don't open a valve and suddenly it, it happens. It's just that the system is designed that if it reaches capacity, it releases out. Because the alternative is then it, it backs up and, and it floods inside people's houses. Um, so they, they will have some figure work um, and we'll, we'll get you what we can. Yeah, OK, so it may not be complete, but at least if we give us an indication. Yeah, and, and you know, these things are monitored by NIEA, um, so it, it'll be dependent on, on, on their figure work. And I suppose it's in relation to that, Damien, and I would like to ask the question uh, in, uh, with regards to Brexit and no alliance for the costs associated with it. We're not looking for absolute figures. You know, the clue of the transition is in the word. Mm -hmm. It was a transition until we left the, um, the EU at the end of this year. So there's 35 days left. And it's to get a sense of the kind of party work that has taken place so that we can get indicative times and indicative costings. Mm -hmm. We may not get the absolutes because mm -hmm. who knows what way a future relationship will unfold. We all knew from the history of what happened in Brexit 
that we would be up against the wire before we would probably know if there would be a future relationship or not. So given that we know that there will be an inco a cost incurred for chemicals having to come in to the north to purify our water and increase cost of those chemicals, surely there should be an indicative figure. We're not asking for the absolute figure as to what that cost would be. Surely we could have an indicative figure as to the kind of cost it would take for any of the impacts of Brexit on, for instance, sewage, water, uh, whether it is uh, chemicals, whatever it's going to be, what's the cost? And can we get at this stage, uh, because I think it would be shocking if we discovered that there had been no mapping exercise done, no indicative times, and we're not looking for absolutes, we're looking for what potentially could this cost if there's no deal, what could it cost if there is a deal, mm -hmm. what will it cost if there's a deal with particular tariffs. Mm -hmm. And I'm mm -hmm. assuming the department would have that work done. Yeah. Um, I guess we can provide absolute shares. There has been a lot of preparation done in terms of um, Northern Ireland Water's preparation for, for Brexit. Um, for example, mapping all of its supply chains, mapping uh, where it gets its chemicals, spare parts, um, really a lot of intensive good work. And that's been work that uh, was done prior to last year, this time last year, uh, never mind this year. Um, but uh, Northern Ireland Water really haven't taken their foot off the pedal on, the, on this front. Um, no, no, you're, you're absolutely right. All right then, can we, as, as committee members, get an indicative cost of what yeah. Brexit is going to have on NA water? What's the cost? I know that you're saying that no allowance for the cost associated with Brexit, that that hasn't been taken into account for the utility regulatory's draft, draft uh, determination. So that makes no allowance for it. But surely, as members of the committee, at this stage, 35 days away from who knows what will happen, that we can get all of that sterling work that you're talking about, and I have no doubt that that's been done, that that's been shared with us as members. Because every time we ask this, we're told we're not going to know until the end of the year. I don't think at this stage that's good enough, mm -hmm. because I know that all that sterling work that you talk about has been done by officials, and I think that should be shared with us. Yep. Um, well. We can take that away. Um, I, I think that's a reasonable enough question. Okay. Um, okay. I think there's something. Um, yeah, I, I was going on to say there, there is continuous sort of scrutiny over uh, what this, what what EU exit is going to mean uh, for the supply chain, uh, for the trading relationship, for for tariffs. Um, and, I, and I guess you could imagine, you know, a series of different models and tiers and, and, and so on. Maybe that is a reasonable sort of question we could we could go down and and look at. Um, and it is all part of it is all part of the plan. Um, but I do s agree with you. Probably there is a sense of uh, w everybody's in sort of this stasis mode, if you like. You know, where we're we're looking at um, sort of the, the UK EU level um, agreements, whatever that looks like. Um, yeah, but Damon, see whatever goes on then, and whatever happens, we will deal with it. We had a year of a transition, and as I say, the clue is in the word transition. So surely in that, that year, and what we have been asking for, and I've constantly asked officials when they've come in front of us, for what's the cost, what's the indicative cost, so that we as a committee is informed, and whatever happens, that we know that we have a particular model that has been shared with us, that this could be the potential impact. And every time we ask, we, talk, we don't know, we don't know what the outcome's going to be. And I don't think that we can sit, because uh, that's not happening, as observers wondering what will happen. Work has been done by officials, but I don't think that that's been imparted to us. As, so I would appreciate you going away and trying to come back with some information and then on that. We'll try to provide you with, with as accurate information yeah. as we can, but I, I, I will. And we know it's it indicative. Come with a caveat. Not, It'll be yeah. high level, and because I, I think some things, um, you know, some things will still be unknown. For example, you know, the impact on electricity prices. You know, it, are we still going to have, um, uh, you know, will, will they go up? Will there be pressure, or actually, will, will it be neutral? Um, Let, let's let's model. But, let's get an indicative yeah. time frame, and let's get an indicative understanding of what the cost could be if this were to happen or that. Would happen. And we know it's not absolute, 
and we're not going to tie you down yeah. to this once yeah, we yeah, have yeah. it and say, oh, but you just told us. Yeah. So we will, example, we will treat it in that yeah, way. For example, that you know, if, if, if certain chemicals um, uh, start to have either tariffs or you know, there's additional paperwork required yeah. to bring them in, what will that look like and what yeah. will that cost? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Kimmins. Thanks, Chair, and the, Linda and Damien. Um, I have a couple of questions I want to cover. Um, but, uh, can you explain to me just how does the utility regulators draft determination then differ from NI Water Fund? And I suppose last week we had Living with Water as well. Um, so for me, I don't mind just to try and differentiate between between all of that. Um, so the, the differences between the uh, business, business plan. plan and the draft determination, effectively, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that the headline really from the draft determination is that the, the utility regulators broadly supportive of uh, Northern Ireland Water's PC21 uh, business plan. So I guess if I, if I look at the numbers, Northern Ireland Water's PC21 business plan had about 3.2 billion of um, investment requirement over the six years. Uh, the draft determinations coming out with uh, 2 billion. And I guess the difference between that two billion to, 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 to two point two billion is it's it's at this point in time it's really a series of challenges, if you like, that the regulators make into Northern Water in terms of um, maybe some of the, the programmes or projects or some of the, the methodologies or calculations that it's used in the business plan. So we we are in this process it is a consultation, we're in this process of consultation where Northern Water and the regulator will be meeting to discuss Northern Water will be providing more information to the regulator. Um, so, uh, at, at this point in time, there may be movement, still movement on both sides, um, where Northern Ireland Water will. They, they are taking a very, you know, robust line in terms of their business plan. Fair enough, they they, they believe in it and uh, they put a lot of hard work and effort into, into coming up with it. So naturally enough, they're they're keen to defend it uh, and, and and share sort of a lot more information with the regulators to, uh, in their mind to to close the gap. Um, so uh, yeah, I think we're just in a. This is a normal kind of regulatory scrutiny challenge process that we're in the midst of. Um, so I, I don't think there's anything too unusual. It would probably be more unusual if there was a bigger gap. Um, really, um, you might think what's or, going yeah, on or, here. Or indeed no gap, because then you could argue that the, regula the regulator isn't actually performing its, its scrutiny function um, properly. You know, I, th I think maybe some of the specific areas where there is a difference is around. Um, you know, the, 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 as David said, the, the cost calculation or the basis for calculating the cost of capital, capital programmes. So I think the regulator says, well, yeah, we hear what you're saying, but we think you can deliver that more efficiently or um, challenge them, them to be more efficient more quickly. Um, so it, it's really saying to them, well, we think you can do a wee bit better than that. Um, so, that, you know, those are the main areas, I think, that, that lead to this slight differential. But, but as Damien said, you know, it's not as if Northern Water says it needs 2.2 billion, and the regular is saying, well, no, you only need 1.5 or a billion, um, or you know, current levels are fine. You know, I think the regular has accepted that there is a significant increase required now. Yeah, no, that, that's fair enough. Yeah. And I suppose the fact that there isn't such a big gap is gives you uh, confidence, I suppose, that everything's on the right track with that. Mm -hmm. um, I know obviously everything is, is very hypothetical at the minute until we know if funding has been secured and how much funding will. Um, but is there a projected timeline? I know um, other members have kind of talked about some of the things that might affect this, but of when work would commence and, and would finish uh, within PC21. Um, do you mean in terms of the scrutiny process um, and release of the final the determination? Or? In terms of delivering it, um, on the ground, I suppose. Oh yeah. Um, well, I guess the uh, the key thing to pick out about uh, water and sewage services it is it is an ongoing process. Um, these price controls, um, you know, the the regulatory price controls, but the work doesn't stop on the ground. Um, the work obviously has to to, to continue on flow, um, and and that's important as well. So, PC twenty one projects, for example. Um, uh, Northern Water is already this year, you know, started uh, a lot of planning, a lot of hard work, a lot of scoping in terms of PC21 to start 
uh, you know, on, on, on the front foot from next year. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the, the funding that was uh, that Minister Murphy recently provided um, uh, in, in September, uh, the additional 15 million, that was specifically for a list of projects, uh, both to, to catch up on, on PC15 uh, as a result of delays that COVID brought us, uh, but also to, to, to help um, with hot starts for, um, for PC21. Um, so the, the, the programme runs at pace. Um, the, the spend profile, um, you know, I, I, I mentioned in terms of what the, the capital budget outlook for 21-22 for is going to look like, um, 220 million. Um, that spend profile is going to increase really as, as PC21 uh, and the projects take, take, take pace again. Um, and that will increase you know, up to sort of a high point in the, in the midpoint of that six year cycle. Uh, before you know, decreasing again slightly towards the end. Um, so yeah, the, the, the price control sometimes might feel like a, a little bit sort of artificial in terms of you know work on the ground and projects ongoing, like you know because obviously stuff needs to continue at pace. Um, it's it's better for efficiency. It's better for planning for these big uh, multi-year capital projects if there's this long-term sort of. Funding certainly that uh, that no matter water can then sit down with contractors and suppliers and so on and, and, and provide a really convincing forward look uh, of, of of work um, that uh, we can get after. Yeah. Okay. And I suppose then just my last question then around around the program of work itself. Um, I know that it was informed through engaged stakeholders and working groups and things like that to try and to identify what the, the biggest need are. Um, can you elaborate a wee bit more on that process? And I suppose would would we as a committee be able to get um, the criteria, or, or um, you know, how how it is decided which projects will be picked and which you know, and how others aren't? Um, I know others have mentioned their constituencies. I'm obviously Murray, Armagh, Murray's have been a major one. Um, we've been raising it for a long time now. Uh, and I suppose not only in terms of future development, but I know in my own area, um, Clevey Road in Uri has had real historical issues there that, that really need addressed and um, that are affecting houses that have been up for many years. So um, it's really just to kind of get um, a, a clearer picture on, on how um, projects are uh, approved, I suppose, under, under this um, and, and where others may miss out. Well, we can we can ask both Nova and Water and the regulator for um, input into that. That'd be great. Okay, thank you, Mr. Beggs. <coughs> Again, Linda and Damon, thanks for your, your presentation. That's a stark reality uh, facing us all, mm -hmm. uh, that's been presented. Uh, but it's better if we understand that. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm trying to unfully understand is. To what degree is PC21 a nonsense process unless the funding within it is actually provided? Well, um, I mean, the regulatory process um, is there to determine what level of service and what level of investment is, is required. And its, it's, its purpose is actually to balance the need for investment with affordability for the customer. Um, and it's really silent on where the money is coming from. Um, and that is how the regulatory process is set up. Um, the fact then that, that um, it's for the executive to provide the funding that would otherwise be coming from domestic paying customers, um, that's really an issue for the executive. Um, and I think it would, would have been wrong to ask the regulator to say, well, you know, we might not be able to afford this, so just tell us, you know, what you could do with money that we could afford. You know, in, in order to be open and transparent, it's important that that regulatory process is gone through so that we know the size and the scale of the problem that's facing us. Um, and that's the purpose of the regulatory process. It's, it's, not, it's not to allocate funding, it's to, it's to determine what is required. And in terms of dealing with underfunding if mm -hmm. all the capital that you've um, said is necessary is not delivered, would it be right as saying that non-compliance would be at the top of the list, otherwise you're actually paying court fines, never mind the actual, so is that what will be prioritised? Yes, yeah, so um, if, if there's um, areas where uh, Northern Water has been found to be 
um, in breach um, and there's court proceedings, um, you know, that's the top priority. The next one will be where they know they are in breach but it hasn't got to court yet because clearly um, court fines um, are just going to be a, an, an additional draw on budgets. Uh, and be any sense of the value of capital funding is required just to deal with that aspect where there are breaches that you know about? Um, I would need to get exact figures from Northern Water, but, but in terms of the wastewater side of the PC21, I think Northern Water would argue that you know, those are areas that are at or near capacity. Some are over capacity. So the over capacity ones would be the ones that would be prioritised first because they're the ones that are likely to, more likely to be in breach. Um, but I would need to, to get further information from Northern Ireland Water on, on exactly which areas those are. I mean, it would be useful to know the scale of capital funding that is needed to avoid the public sector finding, it, finding itself mm -hmm. and resulting in even less improvements occurring because it just gets to be a nonsense if we hit that situation. Mm -hmm. um, th then, uh, in, in terms of um, uh, options go going forward, um, is there investment which makes business case sense? You know, if it's a standalone enterprise, there's always some short term investment that can actually bring you longer term savings and it, it stands on its own feet. So, my question is are there any um, short term investments which make business sense, uh, which perhaps can bring in savings, you know, modern technology, etc., in operations that is not being invested in? Um, because of this lack of capital? Um, well, Northern Ireland Water, um, I think we mentioned just how, how it's addressed the efficiency challenge. Um, really, since 2007, um, £65 million pound annual recurring savings. Um, as a regulator, coming in, this is one, one just to maybe touch on your, your previous question, Mr. Berry, just, um As a regulator company and the regulatory process, brings in this efficiency challenge and really drives down those costs uh, and sets targets for Northern Water to achieve. Um, uh, some of the examples you brought forward in terms of use of technology and uh, use of digital, um, that's, uh, those are initiatives that Northern Water does want to get after. Uh, there are benefits in terms of investing to save, of course, uh, and that's something then that Northern Water includes in its, in its business plan. Uh, and the regulator uh, determines on. Um, so, very much so. Um, the efficiency challenge will continue. It's something we've, we've set out in our social and environmental guidance, and it's something all the water is included in its business plan, uh, and just continuing to try and achieve more savings is something it gets after. I think what it would say to us is that, you know, a lot of the, the low-lying fruit uh, has, been, has been plucked. Um, some of the savings they'll be getting after will be will be harder to achieve. Um, they'll require more innovation, uh, potentially more investment, um, and uh, and they'll be less significant. But um, it's still important that uh, they keep driving forward like that. One of the areas mentioned earlier uh, to look at whether capacity can be increased was to um, examine if some surface water can be removed from the system to increase the capacity that, that um, can actually be channelled towards the treatment plants. Mm. Um, any new development, my understanding automatically, has the surface water uh, separated. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there are separate streams to, to, to do exactly that. Yeah. So are you talking about uh, separating out surface water from older developments? So, or how, how is this increased yeah, capacity? Uh, and it's a mixture depending on on uh, where the development is and, and what the sewage system is in and around it. So you're quite right, you know, um, any new developments is all separated out. Unfortunately, in some areas, what happens then is that the separated out water ends up going into combined sewer because the ultimate sewer is the old Victorian system. And, you know, in those days, we didn't separate out. Um, now, Northern Ireland Water, where feasible and where possible, is, is working towards further separation. So, for example, last year um, there was a major um, project uh, in, in around the Linen Quarter in Belfast where um, exactly that was happening. There were, there were separate, separate sewers and then it all went into one big combined sewer and then it flowed out. They've separated all of that out. 
Now, it comes at a huge cost and you have to dig up the roads. Um, so, you know, that has to be balanced with the need for, um, you know, both new, um, new wastewater systems um, and, as, as Damien said, you know, Im improving and, and innovating what you've got. And so, you know, that's all also part of the regulatory process, you know, how much, how much funding should be put into that type of, of work. Um, it, it could be that, you know, if a developer was looking at, at um, separation, that there may be potential to separate um, water from existing developments or existing roads um, or, or hard surfaces somewhere and put it into a new, a new separated storm, storm sewer that would then go out either into a, a water course of the sea. And, you know, if you think about it, not only will that create better capacity, but in environmental terms, it's a lot more sustainable because otherwise you're putting clean water, which really should be used as an asset, into a drain and pumping it several times, potentially to get to wastewater treatment works, to treat it like it was dirty water when actually it's clean. So, you know, in, in terms of... of, of um, long-term sustainability, it's much preferable to, to take natural rainwater and do something natural with it and, and keep it away from the drains. Um, but there, there, are, there are constraints in some areas about, about what you can and cannot do. Um, in some areas in, in towns and cities, there's just simply not enough room underneath the, underneath the roads, underneath the, the hard surfaces to, to accommodate two full sewers. Um, but where possible, they are doing it. It strikes me we have a total stalemate at the minute and, and no solution and, and, uh, uh, apparent until the funding comes up mm. or agreement to change model mm. occurs. Um, in the meantime, are you looking at any, any other arrangements, whether that be um, additional charges and all new connections to build a, a fund to enable you to do the type mm -hmm. of work you're actually talking about? So that there, you know, just have a, a charge on any new development. You, it, it, does that occur anywhere? Because it's not acceptable just to sit here apart with the problem, and social housing and other developments mm -hmm. and new companies all being stopped because we don't have the sewage solved. We have to get a solution. So, are there any other third ways being examined rather than the stalemate that is presently being expressed? Yeah, I, th I think there are some issues with just saying, well, sure, we'll just charge new developers or developers for new. Um, uh, developments because they're saying, well, why should we then be charged um, and pay for um, improving a system that's already there? So a connection charge, purely yeah. a connection charge. Yeah, and there are connection charges, but again, that's all part of the regulatory process. So the regulator will determine, um, you know, what charges can, can be um, uh, Charged for different things, and you know what what they what can't happen, I suppose, is that that you know we say, well, you know, government can't afford it, so let's just put it on to developers. That wouldn't be entirely fair either. Um, and I get your point. But, you know, but the developers will not be able to develop unless no. there's a solution. So I mean, the, you know, there there are other things being explored. Um, again, not suitable for for all situations, but for example, that there are. Um, there's increasing interest in more natural ways of treating wastewater. So if you look at um, Stonyford or Castle Archdale, and I think now there's one being developed in Limavady, um, there's actually natural ways where you can use natural enzymes to treat wastewater um, through a series of ponds. Um, you need a lot of land, and it's only, um, it's only really feasible for small hamlets, um, but it's, it's, again, a more natural way of, of dealing with wastewater. Um, and as I said, you know, they are, uh, Northern Water is working with developers to see, is there any way around this? Um, I think one thing we are concerned about is the increasing propensity to, th to say, well, OK, you can't deal with the wastewater, so we'll just put in a little package um, plant and we'll run that ourselves. And then invariably what happens is, you know, developers may go bust or walk away and they leave, um, you know, a, a treatment plant that maybe either breaks down or, or was never really built to standard. Northern Water can't adopt it. And then the residents are left. And I have to say that is a concern going forward that if we cannot provide the capacity for development naturally, you know, in, in, in terms of, of a funding constraint, 
will there be more and more um, temptation to build these individual plants? I think that's going to build into a real problem in the future. And do you think is there sufficient awareness, particularly with, with the public and through their convincing solicitors, of the risks that are involved in purchasing such a private plant? Yeah, we, we have, um, because of a number of previous cases and ongoing cases, um, you know, we, we, a couple of years ago, we had um, quite a lot of involvement with the Law Society, because you're quite right. You know, if you are going to buy a house, the first thing you should look at is, is your sewer adopted and is your treatment plant adopted? Because if it's not, and, you know, there's either a management company or there's no management company, you, the residents, the residents are liable for that. Um, and that's what's happened in places like Gallia Shore, where, you know, um, they were, the houses were built, um, there was never a bond uh, entered into by the developer. Um, the treatment plant is now broken, um, and it's, it's in private hands. Um, and that's really what we're trying to avoid. And finally, Ms Kelly. Thanks, Chair. Really, um, that latter point uh, that uh, continues to cause concern around um, the private developers, but I think much of the uh, grounds covered. Um, however, I just wonder. I know there's a plan and review on, and um, um, the the bit about the water and the adoption and the the bond. In terms of that review, are you feeding? Uh, this might be a bit slightly off the presentation, but uh, are, are you entering into dialogue in terms of um, lessons learned, particularly, as you said, by, uh, unfortunately, some um, residents who whose solicitors perhaps haven't been as diligent as they ought to have been, and what recommendations, if any, uh, can you uh, share uh, that planning should be um, seeking to put as conditions uh, into the future, particularly with developers who are repeat offenders and the other point is i think at the outset you referenced new decade new approach um, i don't suppose you can give us any update on whether or not there's any end in sight in terms of the uh, funding aspirations uh, for niw under the commitments entered into under new decade new approach thank you chair thank you okay so in terms of the planning review you know i know northern water is clearly a statutory consultee in the planning process and i know that they have been involved in in that review to see um, how can all the statutory consultees work more collectively with planning authorities to ensure that that you know before planning consent is given everybody's aware of, of um, the position um, I would need to talk to my planning colleagues about about how, how the findings of that are going to be rolled out but we certainly water has been part and parcel of that process and, and you're quite right um, you know it needs to be more joined up and you know, I would like to encourage more pre-development um, application uh, discussions around the capacity for uh, water and wastewater in, in new developments. Um, we've also clearly um, had a lot of interaction with councils on their local development planning process um, because, um, and, and I can understand and rightly, councils are also concerned that they have real aspirations for growing their, their council and their economy and, and providing housing where it's needed. Um, and this could all be constrained because of, of the lack of, of wastewater capacity. We're very well aware of that. Um, Which, well, can I just come back in? In terms of the pack that estate agents uh, or whoever is the agent for selling the properties, could there be a requirement um, that there's an upfront um, information given from NIW uh, rather than depending on um, the solicitor but not shifting the area of responsibility to NIW just to say look there's a tick box yes there's a bond in place yes it's a statutory obligation or whatever or a buyer beware you know point um, yeah I mean I'm not I'm not sure that we would have to make it mandatory, but certainly it's something that we could we could look at in terms of encouraging that. Um, and as I said, we, we have had um, in the past discussions with the Law Society to ensure that their members were um, adequately and accurately advising their their own um, clients. Uh, I mean, we have heard of examples where solicitors have got it wrong. They've told they've told people buying houses that, that the um, systems were adopted and they weren't. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, on NDNA, um, uh, you know, we, we are um, reminding um, the UK government um, because they have a commitment um, under NDNA, and clearly we are also then um, uh, adding that into um, the reason why our bid in the next CSR process needs to be met. And NDNA specifically name checked uh, the Living with Water program and investment in, in wastewater. So it's those three sort of lines that we have included in our, our, our returns to, to DOF in terms of really spelling out um, under NDNA. This is what these two lines will uh, will cost to put right if we want to meet the uh, ambitions of, of NDNA. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And the final determination will obviously be published then on the 16th of March next mm-hmm. year. And do you anticipate any changes um, in advance of that? Um, I, I don't think the regulator will will um, publicly announce any changes before that. Um, no, I mean that the, they have to now wait until the end of the consultation process. Take. Um, their responses into account. I mean, clearly, Northern Water, as we've said, is either challenging some of the assumptions and, and you know, looking to get it back up nearer to what their business plan said. Um, the regulator is going to have to balance that against any other response that, that um, they get from their own consultation. So we, we don't expect anything to be produced in advance of the 16th of March. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much. I very much appreciate your, your time okay. this morning. Um, don't worry. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, members, moving then to our. If there are any other questions that you felt that you needed answered, um, if you, we, can, point, we, can write, we can write to the department. Yeah. Because it's an important point. See the local development plans. I mean, you know, if each area says we want to build 10,000 units over the next 10 years, that's, that's what the local development plans do. I was going to ask the final one. We, we, we need to be asking where the local development plans are. And how is this PC21 going to? Not only there's a gap now in provision, but if they identify in each area plan, there's so many units to build, be it social housing or private, over the next 10 years or 15 years of their plan, where are we at in all of that? So those. Okay, so we can we can ask the, we can ask the department in relation what um, what the status is of each of the development plans yeah. across um, all of the council areas. Some of them are much more progressed than, than, others. than others, so it might be useful just even outside of that yeah, process to have a um, an understanding of that process. Okay, so I'm mindful that we need to be out of here by one o'clock, so we do have a further briefing. So. We'll um, this is in relation to com- from the Community Transport Association. So, um, at page one nine eight, you'll find the briefing paper from CTA, and at page two hundred and five, it's um, how the work that they carried out during um, um, COVID nineteen. And again, Hansard will record the meeting. We're welcome to um, our session. Oh, yeah. Tim Cairns, who's the director of policy and public affairs. Um, Paddy McEldowney, the Chief Executive of uh, Easy Link Community Transport, and Ashley Kane, Chief Executive out and about transport. You're all very welcome to um, the meeting this morning. Um, I, I'm not sure who's giving I'll, the I'll presentation. I'll kick off, Chair, if that's okay. Yes, yeah. of course. From the I mean, I've got a bit of cold sweats being back in, in this room. Indeed. I'm glad I'm sitting here and Sam McBride's not sitting behind me. But, um, but thank you very much, committee, for, for giving us this time today to, to share what, we, uh, what community transport has done uh, throughout the pandemic and to also to share some of the issues that we have as community transport providers uh, in Northern Ireland. What I want to do is just, just share very quickly of what community transport is, and then I'll hand over to, to Paddy and Ashley, who will uh, go through some of the issues that we've got and, and explain some of the stuff that, that we've done and explain about some of the services that are offered uh, through community transport uh, throughout uh, the whole of Northern Ireland. But community transport is it's a group of charities. It's, it's not-for-profits who offer transport solutions uh, to people across Northern Ireland. It's not just uh, primary purpose transport providers like Paddy and and Ashley represent. There's also churches, sports clubs, uh, youth clubs who who also offer community transport in their area. Community transport typically uh, operates under what's called a 10B permit. 
And we in the Community Transport Association, we're the, the membership body for community transport, and we issue 10B permits uh, on behalf of the department to uh, all of our members, uh, to the primary purpose operators that, that Patty and Ashley represent, and to the churches and schools and, and various charities uh, who offer community transport solutions in their areas. We have about uh, 155 members of the Community Transport Association, but there are other people who aren't members of, of CTA who offer community transport in, in various parts of Northern Ireland. Community transport provides an accessible solution to transport that's inclusive for everybody. That's really our goal, is to provide accessible, inclusive transport that everybody can be part of and that everybody uh, can get to, to what they need, to health appointments, to recreation, to shopping, to visit their social networks. And through the pandemic, uh, what we've discovered is community transport was vital and was essential to helping communities to um, to, to function, to survive, to help people who were faced with loneliness and isolation. And I'll hand over to Ashley, who is going to tell us a bit more about that. We in the Community Transport Association produced a report, which I think is in your committee packs, which lays out uh, what we did through the, through the pandemic. But Ashley is going to highlight just a few of the things that we did and maybe explain some more about our services. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for your time today. As um, the agenda states, I'm Ashley Keane from Out and About Community Transport, and, um, and as I say, I got the illustrious title of Chief Executive Officer on, on the agenda, but as I say, most days I feel like I'm um, Chief Cook and, and Bottle Washer whenever it, it comes down to it, and especially uh, throughout the pandemic and throughout this, this time of, of, of challenge. So, um, I just want to tell you a wee bit about out and about community transport. We would cover the, the old Macrofeld District Council area. And whilst we're an individual community transport partnership and organisation, we work in close partnership with Cookstown um, CDM Community Transport, and they would cover Cookstown and Dungannon districts. So right across the, the, uh, the, the, the district, where we, we cover all of the services. And sort of under our partnership agreement, um, we would offer each other support and we would share resources. So if a bus, we have problems with a bus, we can, can, can share vehicles and, and loan each other vehicles to, to help one another out. Mm. And as I suppose, we're always looking at ways to enhance um, sort of the, the transport options right across that mid Ulster um, area. But um, if I may, I'm going to try and paint a picture for you for what community transport looked like throughout um, the province before the pandemic struck. So um, collectively, the Northern Ireland partnerships provided 250,000 passenger trips last year under our dial-a-lift service, which I'm sure um, you know provides local members um, who live in isolated rural areas and who are mainly elderly or have a disability with demand responsive door-to-door -door services so that they can access and it's it's the the key is they access the local services so the dial -a lift uh, deals purely with with the local local area so it's local members um, of our own organizations accessing local services through the dial -a lift um, uh, service and I suppose the reason for the huge success of community transport is in its delivery model, and as Tim had said, under the 10B permit. Um, so um, the model that we use is we use both paid drivers who drive the fully accessible uh, minibuses under the Section 10B permit, and we also use volunteer car drivers who use their own vehicles um, to, to help us out. So it gives us so much more flexibility whenever it comes to um, being able to offer our members um, you know, the, the transport options that they need. Um, and most of our members would use us for shopping, personal business, health appointments, um, going to visit friends, getting a haircut, all those types of, of, of services that keep everybody well and, and happy. Um, I suppose over 35% of all of our dial-a-lift trips last year were completed by our volunteers. So, and, and just as a matter of interest, if we had to pay wages for all of the hours that they had, they had given up freely, it would cost in excess of about £230,000 um, for their time alone, not to mention 
diesel and, and all the, those other expenses that, that would be added into the pot. Um, our volunteers are invaluable to the service and we need to ensure that we continue to use this model um, as we go forward to sustain community transport services. Um, as volunteers uh, wouldn't be able to use if we went to a commercial model in, in terms of, of you know, the operator licence. Um, so the permit is, is actually key to, to keeping the costs and keeping the efficiency and the effectiveness of, of community transport and, and giving us that flexibility to be able to deliver as much as we do. So um, another big benefactor of, of community transport is our health department. And I think Patty's going to maybe add something to this, but um, over the last year we have had 25,000 direct trips to hospital appointments across the province and you know there hasn't been any support um, from, from the health sector on this and as I say Patty will probably um, finish off or, or give more detail on that whenever he, he speaks. But, um, Folks, as we entered into the last quarter of 2019 and 20, we could see a big decline in demand for our services. And basically, they had naturally begun to, to wind down due, um, you know, due to the, the profile of our member base. Basically, it's elderly, vulnerable, and people with disabilities. And then when Boris Johnson made his, uh, his announcement on the 23rd of March, a date that I'm sure none of us will ever forget um, as we go forward. Um, all our requests uh, for transport ceased right across the board. So we were all in that same position where here we were, we were ready to do something, but we had no people to transport. We had nothing, no work to do. And it was then that the partnerships quickly sprung into action and uh, we changed our tactics. Uh, we got some guidance from the department that we could could deliver alternative services and so all of the partnerships then started offering services like delivering groceries delivering prescriptions the food parcels the department for communities food parcels were delivered through a lot of the partnerships food bank parcels so there was all of those additional things that that were going on and um and I suppose as well there was a rela uh, relaxation in terms of, of the permit because the permit only allows us to do stuff for members. So that was relaxed out and we could service non-members. So it, it allowed us to, to meet the needs within our local communities. Um, and I suppose what I would like to talk about as well is some of the main runners that um, for out and about. Um, you know, we partnered with the local shops and offered to help um, out with the staggering demand for groceries, and we had delivered about um, 1,300 uh, different individual uh, grocery deliveries uh, with Crawford's and, and with Kelly's Eurospar in, in Mahara. And um, we partnered with the local council, and we've done about 1,000 food of the Department for Communities food, food parcels. And as well, we had um, had done some work with the local food bank in um, Mahara Cross Community Food Bank in in, uh, in Mahara, and and we had helped them out as well with with getting the food out to where it needed to go and and, and those vital parcels. But what I would have to say is our most successful alternative service was our Meals Within Wheels service, our project, um, and that's something that I'd like to talk about. Um, we worked with George Shields from the Mid-Ulster Volunteer Centre and we sort of combined our, um, our databases. We did a scoping exercise to find out was it something worthwhile, was there a need out there in the community and the, the demand was there. So we, in our first week we started delivering um, foods and, and it was just after Easter we started and our first week we delivered uh, 40 meals on the on the. Wednesday and we delivered 50 on the Saturday and that just continued to rise and in the height of, of the pandemic we were delivering over 100 meals every day on a Wednesday and on a Saturday and then um, as the time went on we introduced a wee pudding because everybody was looking for a wee sweet thing as well that and and, and it went down an absolute treat so um, I suppose what I, what I really want to say is like it just wasn't about getting a meal and getting something delivered to your door. 
Um, the service provided so much more. Our staff were on the phone twice a week with all of these people. They were asking them what they wanted for their menu. That was the first off. How are you? You know, so that chance to check in, chat, and see that everybody was okay. And then, as we all know, the, the, the folk about Northern Ireland, everything's grand, they're always all right, there's never anything wrong, and especially with the older generation, you know, they wouldn't, they're, they're not quick to tell you, well, some of them are not quick to tell you that, that they would need some help. So whenever our drivers then went out to deliver the meals, and um, that's whenever they could sort of do the face to face, and they could see and they could tell, because these are people that they have transported for, for many years, and then they could look and see that face to face contact and see, you know, if if the face was telling the same picture that the, the that was being told on, on the phone at the, at the end of the line. So I suppose then, if any of our drivers had any concerns, then it was being flagged up that. Um, you know, flagged back into the office and we would have increased the contact with them or tried to signpost to other organisations that were offering help or assistance. So, and I keep saying this, at risk of sounding like a, an m and ad, this was no ordinary meal <laughs> delivery project. Um, it is still continuing today and we had 62 meals going out this morning and 14 puddings. So, um, so that, that's that. Sorry? What's the pudding today? The pudding today is um, jam sponge with <laughs> coconut and custard. <laughs> so, and I suppose just on a, on a final note, um, <laughs> you know, just thinking about all of those people that, that we have, have tried to help out, um, you know, on the importance that the phone calls wear to their daily lives. And I, I still, I can still hear the girls in the office, I can still hear those phone calls that at the start it was like, what are you ringing me for? You know, why, why are you ringing me? And the phone calls were very short and very sweet to start off with. And those phone calls got longer and longer and longer as the time went on. So, you know, it has become a real lifeline and that's something that we have continued because obviously our services have not resume to the full level of what we were doing. People are still behind closed doors and there's a lot of people out there, um, you know, a lot of our members who haven't been outside the door since March, you know, and I worry that going forward, you know, if we are not there to still to pick up those pieces and try and encourage, you know, and the loneliness and all of that, then, you know, it's, it's a vital service that we that we offer. and. And we have been very quick to, to be able to adapt to these new challenges. And, and um, you know, so I hope that, that going forward, we'll be able to continue all the good stuff that we're doing. So thank you very much. I'll pass over to Paddy. Thanks, it was Sasha. actually re reassuring, I think, throughout all that and the challenge that you're facing, that you're still smiling. Yeah. <laughs> There's days. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just nerves. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ashley, and uh, thanks, to Chair and Committee, for allowing us a chance to speak to you today. Um, I just, I suppose, following on from what Ashley said, I, I, I manage EasyLink Community Transport, and we provide service across the rural parts of Derry and Stoban Council area and the OMA half of Fermanagh and OMA. Um, so, um, and we deliver the same, the dial lift service across those areas, and have done for many years. Uh, we also provide the Disability Action Transport Scheme service in Straban Town and Oma Town on behalf of Disability Action. And, and then the other uh, core service um, we'd be providing is, the, is our sort of, uh, group hire service for community groups and, and, and groups that need um, s small charities that, that, that will use our vehicles for their activities. Um, so just quickly on, on, on EasyLink, sort of uh, what we did, just again to give people a flavour of, of the range of, of services, we were very heavily involved in the DFC food parcel deliveries. Both councils approached us directly, Derry and Stoban and from Ananoma, to see if we could look after it all. Uh, uh, and other councils tried to mix some of their own resources with community resources and, and whatever worked in these areas. But uh, we delivered all the food parcels in Derry and Stoban into the rural areas, so uh, not counting Dairy study in Straban Town. The, the DFC funded neighbourhood renewal partnerships and groups would have been involved in the urban areas, and we delivered all the parcels in the, in the rural parts of the district. And then again, in, in Fermanagh and Oma, we delivered all the parcels in Oma, and Fermanagh Community Transport delivered them in, in, in the Fermanagh end. And, and across the two councils, um, 
in, in my area alone, we, we delivered over 14,000 food parcels through that 16 or 17 week period. Um, and both councils have, have publicly and on a number of occasions uh, not only thanked us for it, but, but have declared that they just couldn't have done it without an organisation like ourselves that had that network of not only the resource, the drivers and the vehicles that were suitable for these big heavy boxes, but knowing the local areas and knowing every wee lane and, and, and country road, um, it, it really helped as well for us to be able to do that uh, quite efficiently. Um, we also, very early on, when we shut down, and it was, what do we do now? I was having uh, conversations with staff on Zoom. We all were working from home. And I was sort of saying, well, what do we do with our, with our clients? And all the, the office staff were saying, well, they were naming clients. You know, Maggie's on her own. She has no family. Her daughter's in England. You know, so they, our, our, our staff know the clients really, really well. And they were concerned about, this is going to go on for weeks. What are we going to do? So, they sort of said, we need to be ringing them every week. So we set up a situation where we just took all the list of regular users, we divvied it up in a spreadsheet, and every, every staff member took home a list of 50, 60, 70 names. And on a weekly basis, they just started ringing the members. And as Ashley said, the first few weeks, it was, it was kind of like, oh, you're going to ring me? Are oh, you going to ring me next week too? Oh, good to hear from you. Thanks for ringing. You know, I'm, I'm glad you thought about me. But as, as the weeks went on, those, those conversations were really important. And not only were we ringing up to say hello and hope you're well and we're just checking up, but there was an element then of trying to just suss out and are you getting a bit of food and are you getting your groceries and how are you feeling? So it developed into more of a sort of a, just not just a chat, but a just double, just double checking that they, they weren't in trouble and they didn't have a particular need. And then we were referring to any, again, a lot of those clients wouldn't be on social media, but you all know that every group in the country, especially the rural areas, you know, the churches, the GA clubs, the other sporting groups, they were out saying, we'll lift prescriptions for you, we'll get your shopping from the shop. They were offering all this help on social media, but a lot of our clients weren't seeing it. So we were making that connection. Rather than us, for example, running a bus from Straban out to the far side of Plum Bridge to lift a prescription a mile. We were just saying, well, look, the, the, the GA club up there is doing that. We'll get you on to them. We'll, we'll get you the number. They lift it and get it over to you. So, or, or such and such a shop's doing home deliveries. We'll get you in connected to them. So we were making those connections for those individuals who we were identifying as very isolated and, just, and, and maybe didn't have much family support. So the befriending support calls, I think they were, they were, it wasn't seen and we didn't, it's hard to publicise that too for us. But in my opinion, that was probably the most important thing we did. Um, and just another wee, it's a wee silly one, and, and, and it's a very small scale numbers wise, but we actually had a hook up with Tiny Life, the premature baby charity. And um, they operate out of the neonatal units. And in Elton and Galvin, they have a unit there. And the Tiny Life support worker is based in the neonatal unit normally. But with lockdown, if you weren't a doctor or a nurse, you, you couldn't be there. So they had to remove themselves from the neonatal unit. And, uh, they, they, they have a breast pump loan scheme, so when mum goes home, she can take the breast pump with her and use it for a few months, and then it goes back to the new and in it and uh, recycled and back out again. But they had no way of getting these collected. So uh, there was an email came out from, it was through Disability Action, Can Anybody Help in that northwest area? We signed up, and it was only once a fortnight, and we're doing it still now, where we just were given a number of addresses and names, just picking up, and we were in Stoban and Oma, we were as far as Maher Felt or Limavadi or Colin, and, and collecting these breast pumps and bringing them to the, the Tiny Life support worker, who was then cleaning them up and recycling them. So that's just another wee example of the way we found ourselves, uh, how we could help everybody and anybody. So, and again, not just from EasyLink's point of view, I, I certainly would be very proud of the, our, our sector's response. I think we, uh, and I think the report shines a light in that, where I think we were very, very responsive, uh, very agile, very quick to be able to find ways of, of helping out in our, in our local areas. So that's just the bit that, that we did. Um, the one thing I just want to talk about then is our sort of our, 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 the financial side of what, where we are at the minute and, and maybe looking forward. So as outlined in the, in the, in the report that Tim uh, shared and pulled together, um, we had a significant cut in our funding back in 2014, back in it was DRD at that time of nearly 40%. So pre-COVID, we, we were getting it very tight. We were all under a lot of pressure. We were all probably operating at, at, at uh, full capacity or very close to it. So, um, and, in, and in that case, we, we were, in some cases, not able to meet all the demand in our area and would have had restrictions in our service. For example, for uh, two or three years, we were operating a system where we could only offer two trips a week because the demand was more than we could provide. 
and it's really difficult to decide who should go and who shouldn't. And, and we debated it for ages at our board level, and, and the only way we could try and be fair to everybody was allow a certain number of trucks per week. Now, that doesn't suit everybody that's attending a, a centre that operates three and four days, or, or the day opportunities and the adults who learn disabilities need to get to their tech classes for three or four, weeks, or three or four days a week. But that's all we could do. So we went into COVID at full capacity under quite a bit of pressure financially to, to meet the demand in our areas. Um, with COVID, we panicked. We thought, how's this going to add up? We're not lifting any passengers. So we're getting no smart pass money in through the DERA arrangement, through the arts scheme. Um, uh, you know, our funding was usually associated to activity. So if you were big demand, a lot of activity, there was more money. When we were in that first week doing very little, we panicked and think, are our funders going to turn around and say, well, if you're not out delivering, well, we don't need to fund you as much. So we, we were really concerned. Now, to be very fair to all the key funders, DFI, our core funder, and DERA on the arts money and through Disability Action as well, with over, over a period of time, three, four, five weeks, they all sort of committed to last year's uh, funding levels. I certainly would be very much of the opinion that um, they held back a week or two, but when they seen all the activity we were delivering, like we've just described, I think that reassured them to say, look, let this money go because they're out there doing something with it and, and, it's, and it's looking like they're being very effective. So that was great. Um, but looking ahead, we, we, we're, we're very concerned uh, and it looks like there's a light in the tunnel with COVID and vaccines and, and we hopefully in the spring tend to be moving, moving out of that. Um, and it's something we're, we're really looking forward to. And as Ashley said, you know, we, we care about our clients and we know the, the nine months they've had and it'll be a year by, time, by the time they're maybe getting back out again. So we're really keen to get our older and vulnerable clients back out again. Um, and, and we know the importance of their wee clubs and their wee groups to them and their, their social life and their friends and stuff. Um, but we have, we have a couple of really big concerns. Um, we do expect there to be a significant increase in demand for our services when we get back up and running again, especially with regard to health and hospital appointments. We, we, there's just going to be a, an avalanche of demand there, and we're very concerned that we're not going to be positioned to, to help uh, to deliver these appointments be, just because of a lack of resource, not, not for any other reason. Um, we're also a wee bit concerned that as these activities come back up and running again, uh, there still may be some level of social distancing requirements. Um, and at the minute, uh, with the two metre rule and, 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 and social distancing, we're operating with a maximum of five passengers in a 16-seater minibus. So again, if, if services open up again, and if the hospital appointments start coming out again, um, you know, if we can't yeah, we can't get more than five people into a vehicle. That's really restricting our capacity. The other thing, too, is the, the volunteer care scheme, which is absolutely priceless. Again, Ashley touched on it and described it very well, how well it complements the, the paid driver and the minibus fleet, uh, where the care scheme can fit in around that and do the individuals and the appointments. Uh, with social distancing, a number of partnerships have, have done their risk assessment and deemed it to be a bit too risky for particularly our volunteers, and it's quite close quarters. So the care schemes, a lot of them are sort of on hold at the minute. So depending on that social distancing advice as the services open up again, we could be hit with a big increase in demand and a reduction in our capacity, just on the physical capacity of the vehicles and, and the use of the care scheme or not. Never may, you know, so we, 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 we're very concerned. We're trying to flag it up now rather than waiting to May and trying to get up here and bang the table and shout to cry poverty. We, we would be um, asking the department to if there's any way they can, they can help us in that. And again, we're not pointing the finger entirely or asking that of Department of Infrastructure only. If DFI can find a few more pounds, and it's not big money. I mean, we're, our, our total budget is about 2.2 million across all the partnerships. You know, uh, I think the department are getting very good value for money for that. You know, the, the, the addition that would keep us up and running and maybe ready to meet that demand, you know, another four, five, 600,000 pounds would make a huge difference. So we're not asking for tens of millions of pounds. It's, 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 it's in the bigger scheme of things, it's a, it's a modest ask, um, but it would make such an impact to, to what we do and what we'd be in a position to do come, come the springtime. Um, so, and again, it's not, as I say, we talked about DFI, a big chunk of our, our activity is, is health-related transport. If it's not direct health appointments, it's to you know, health-related activities or services. You know, maybe up to 40% of our activity you could, you could uh, claim or, or, or label as, as health transport. And, and there's no support from, from that department. Now, we know DFI officials for a number of years now have tried and made the call and asked the question, but unfortunately it's never progressed beyond that. 
Um, there's also, we suspect, you know, potentially um, COVID recovery monies. I know, there's, I know there's been monies divvied out early this week, and, and that may happen again in the next financial year. You know, I, th I would think there's a very strong case for, the, for DFA to make the case for the Lake of Community Transport and how we're responding to COVID and helping people getting back from lockdown and from being isolated. So whether that's central money sitting in the Department of Finance for, for COVID uh, recovery, or I know a lot of it's funneled through Department of Communities, um, whether we can make a, a bid there. Uh, the, the wee issue we have with Department of Communities, and it's not, it's not um, their problem, but, but a lot of their money seems to end up in the urban areas and the neighbourhood and rural areas and stuff like that, and, and the Department of Communities' money very rarely finds its way into the rural areas. This would be a very good way of Department for Communities showing their support for rural communities and, 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 and seeing a bit of money flowing in rural areas as opposed to the suggestion that it all goes into the, the deprivation and the, and the urban areas only. So um, that's really all the, the, the points I wanted to raise, and I really do appreciate the chance to speak today. I, I'm handing back to Tim for he's one more wee point he wants to discuss. Does well, he want to raise it now, or does he want to raise it during questions? I'm I was going to say, I was just about to say, <laughs> I, I, I think we'd probably better move to questions. There's, there's some stuff on, on Section 22 services, but I know that, that you, you'll probably want to ask questions on that. So, um, so yes, Chair, I'm, I'm happy for us to, to take some questions. Okay, thank you. And can I say I'm really pleased to see you here today. Um, I know that we've been trying to organise a session really since we came back in January because I understand the, the valuable service that community transport provides right across um, rural Northern Ireland. And um, I've spoken to Timothy a number of times now just with regards to the challenges that you had pre-COVID, never mind what you've had now um, during this period. And, and certainly the the paper that's been provided is, is excellent, uh, and and the um, the sort of profile piece that you've done and around the, the work that you've done throughout the COVID period, I think should be um, should be something that you sort of put out much much more widely because really, in some ways, you are sort of unsung heroes, and the work that you do is done very mm -hmm. sort of quietly, and it is time perhaps that you did sort of blow your own trumpet a little bit more, uh, and for people to really understand the work that you do, which is, goes beyond. Um, just um, picking up um, passengers, and and for me, I suppose the the key line in, in the presentation was community transport is, is at the front line in helping tackle loneliness and isolation, and that's exactly what you do. Um, so it does concern me, and it does worry me um, the challenges that you have, particularly around funding. And I know that um, CTA then have called for a review, which will will include both funding and particularly around um, um, Section 22. So really interested um, to hear from you, Timothy, around both of those aspects and you know the conversations that you've had and also the obstacles that there are, particularly around um, Section 22, because in some ways um, that would be a lifesaver for community transport service and, and those that it provides a service for. Um, so, if you if you do want to yeah, expand uh, on that, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for your support, and, and thank you for all the time that, that you've provided for us and, and for other members of the committee as well. Uh, I mean, we we know we've got an open door, and and people are prepared to to discuss our issues with us and and to take them up on our behalf, and we've really appreciated that uh, from members of the committee, and particularly you as well, uh, Chair. And that, in terms of Section Twenty Two services, um, I think you know it's important to say this isn't about taking stuff from the commercial sector. This is about complementing TransLink. You know, as we move out of the pandemic, TransLink are in a very precarious financial position themselves. And Section 22, Section 22 relates to Section 22 of the 1985 Transport Act, uh, which covers England, Scotland and Wales. And these are permits that, were really issue, that, are, that are issued in England, Scotland and Wales, where the market can't provide that service any longer. So typically, uh, the public bus company abandons a route because it's not profitable, and either the local community band together and they put the service on themselves, uh, which is very common, about 40% of Section 22 services are the community coming together to do that themselves, or it's, it's kind of a top-down approach. Either the public bus company 
comes to the local community or a local community transport provider and says, could you provide this in partnership with us? So you could get a situation where a rural bus service is profitable 8 o'clock to 9.30, and then again 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock, but it's not profitable 9.30 to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So the public bus company runs it at the time it's profitable, and at the time where you can break even, the community transport provider or the community partners. So this isn't about you know, the commercial sector not being able to operate and community transport taking that over on the cheap. It's about complementing services that are there. Translink are already, are already saying unprofitable rural uh, routes need to be addressed and need to be looked at. Well, Section 22 permit is a way that community transport, and not just community transport, communities can partner with Translink to provide uh, different solutions to the way they operate. But also, I think, for community transport providers, they could uh, adapt their service where stuff they currently offer under a 10B permit could be widened out. I mean, Ashley had said currently under a 10B permit, you can only offer service to people who have become members of your organisation. A Section 22 permit allows you to offer services to the general public. So where there's capacity, so let's say there's, you know, we're not in COVID times, and there's six or seven people going to a day centre. That service could be adapted where the five or six extra seats could be offered to members of the public who are travelling along the same rural routes to the same towns, uh, and they could they could then uh, that that additional capacity that there is uh, could then be utilised and used. So it's really it's 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 not a it's not a solution in and of itself, the Section 22 permit. But it's a way of complementing what TransLink provides, allowing TransLink to work with communities to, pr to provide bottom-up solutions to transport. And I think it would just be another tool in the arsenal. Now, uh, yeah, in that, sorry, Chair, yes? Yeah, no, I was going to ask, what, why is there a reluctance then to um, explore this if you're saying that this is about complementing what's already in place as opposed to being a competitor? That, that's a great question, and I think uh, if you go back to 1985, I think there was a lot of reluctance and nervousness from commercial operators in England, Scotland and Wales. They thought probably what maybe TransLink and other commercial operators here think, this is just community transport to come in and do this on the cheap. And that is not what happened. Commercial operators in, in, in England and communities in England have seen, and local authorities in England have seen this as a way of providing transport where those routes couldn't be provided. I'll give you an example. There's a, an organisation we've been working with. This is a commu just community, a community that has just come together. And they, in Oxford, it's a little village outside Oxford, they used to have a bus that went from their village to Oxford, to the city of Oxford. That, that was not commercially viable, it's ended, and a community is banded together and with the help of the local authority and with the help of CTA, they now run a bus route from their local village to the main bus centre in Oxford, and that opens up obviously a myriad of travel across, the, uh, across uh, England for that small community of about 3,000 people, and this is volunteers that undertake that. The bus company abandoned that route about 10 years ago because it's not commercially viable to run a bus from a village of 3,000 people to a city. So, but the bus company were obviously were supportive of that because you're actually running that bus to their hub. And they were able to provide some funding for that to take place because it is a valuable asset to them, even though it's not profitable. So it just gives innovative and imaginative solutions. And I think really what, what I would say is people need to look at places like Strathclyde, where this has worked innovatively with the public bus company and community transport, and, and to look at those areas um, and see how this isn't competition. This actually is a way of solving some of the problems that TransLink, uh, the TransLink have. Okay, and just then, uh, the first question was in relation to your budget and the mm. discussions that you've had with the department in, in relation to that. Obviously, it's cross-departmental, yeah. um, but um, primarily with DEFI. Yeah, in, in terms of budget, um, you know, the, the budget's flatlined for the last couple of years, and, and the, the budget you know, was severely cut in 13-14. And I think where we're sitting right now is... Um, I don't know that there's a prospect next year, currently, of our budget being increased. And I think that that's going to provide uh, real difficulties uh, for us uh, across the piece in uh, 2021. The budget has to increase next year because capacity is going to be lower, um, because uh, demand is going to be higher in terms of you know when the health service starts to open up and all those things that Paddy's outlined. So where we're at in discussions with the department is you know we're making the representations that are, that the budget has to go up. It hasn't increased. Um, 
in actual terms, let alone real terms, in, in two years uh, following the severe cuts. So, you know, if this service is going to stay on the road, if we're going to be able to meet the demands that the people have uh, going forward uh, to use the service, then there's going to have to be uh, an increase. But a modest increase, you know, as Paddy outlined, 200, 300, 400,000 goes a long way because the big costs are putting the bus on the road and putting the driver in the bus. To actually then increase service, increase demand, to move, you know, to, to, to providing more trips each week is, is actually it's a marginal gain in that for the money that can be invested. So for a small amount of money, actually a lot of extra trips because the big ticket items, if you like, are already paid for and already there. So it's just it's just these small amounts of money can make big difference. And it's really just trying to get that message across to, to the department. Okay, thank you. Mr Buchanan. Thank you. Thank you, Timothy, uh, Paddy and Ashley. Ashley. Ashley done a great job and Sam Madolce there. I have to hand it to you on the, the pudding. <laughs> definitely pushed David over the edge. <laughs> He's very cross about that. Thank you. So, uh, no, and Paddy as well, I, I can hear it from your comments, the, the passion you have for it. I want to talk about the, the funding model, roughly. So what is your funding model? We'll talk about that 2.2 million, roughly, from DFI. You've all had income from um, DERA. What's the rest of it? And you talked, actually, you briefly touched on the fees for members. So let's say 100% is everything. You know, give me a, a rough breakdown what the funding model is based on DFI, DERA, and membership income, and maybe you know, presume funding yourselves. The the the, the dear money uh, varies. It's, it's paid out on, on actual usage yeah. through through show and smart passes, but it has it has tended to be in around the six or seven hundred thousand mark. So if we're getting two point two million from DFA for the core service, uh, dear are topping that up by another six or seven hundred thousand, and have done for eight or nine or ten years now. Um, we we then have. Uh, a number of the part, most of the partnerships have money through the Disability Action Transport Scheme. Um, I'm not sure if that total figure collectively for the rural areas, but I know we get 60 or 70 thousand in my area uh, for for delivering in the two in Straban and Oma. Uh, so, so there's a few hundred thousand, four or five hundred thousand pound there coming through Disability Action. The other big service is the is the group hire. Now it's, it's self finance, and we we charge a full cost recovery fee to the group. For that time and miles, so so uh, there's an early rate for the driver's uh, time and a, and a mileage rate, but that that's on a full cost recovery basis. So you could do a hundred thousand pounds worth, or you could do nothing. So as long as you've that price break, you're not. If you if that activity drops, that's bad for the community. They're not getting out. But we panicked about that at the start of the year. But the fact that the way it's borne out. If we're not doing those trips, it's not costing us any money. So we're not losing because that money's not there, but the community's losing because we're not providing those uh, connections for them. So, so really, you're, you're looking at the DFA money at 2.2 the million, the, the DARE money at six or seven hundred thousand, and the DATS money at four or five hundred thousand. So that, that's, our, that's collectively across Northern Ireland, shared out among eleven organisations. See the DARE money? Did that? Based on, on, on trips, did that start? You know, did they still maintain that 600k, or did they take it away from you completely? No, that, that, that was the one we panicked about. We thought if they do take it away yeah. because we're not doing the passenger trips, because nobody's showing a smart pass, we'd have been out of business. And, and to be fair to Dira, they just said, look, as long as you're out helping rural communities, they, they, they committed to it for the first three months, April, May, June, and then they came in before then June to say, look. And again, I think it's entirely because of the what the work we did do, and they could see clearly. We were reporting back to them on a weekly basis. And then they says, look, we'll honour this for the rest of the year. So what we were getting last uh, in, in April 19, they gave us in, in, in April 20. So they, they matched the activity from the previous... The, so the, is that the k we'll call it, uh, secured to March, end of March? Yeah, yeah end of March. And is that a yearly figure? Yes. That's secured every year. So what's the outlook on getting that next year based on... Uh, I don't mean this disrespectful, very few trips. What are they saying about next year going forward? We don't know yet. Is the is the real answer, but we are hoping that that those discussions will will take place between DFI and DERA in in the coming common months, and and that that will be, I suppose, in the workings of of what happens as we as we go forward. So we, as I say, we're really not sure. And the the DERA money and the furlough money were two of the things that that I suppose kept us afloat. Yeah. This you know. Because our activity hasn't been as great, our expenses maybe haven't been as high as 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 what um, what they normally would be. But going forward, um, from April onwards, then we're sort of 
staring into the unknown at this at this point in, in time. So we're we're not sure. And if it does um, be reflective of activity, then it will be a big so, a big loss. So going forward from April, what do you see your costs going to based on the fact? You have an explosion, people we hope look on your services, but you've a redu reduction in capacity in your buses. So do you see your you know do you see that going up by twenty percent? You know, what's your do what's your cost gonna rise, if you any idea? I know it's not a, a direct comparison because you've got the buses, you've got the drivers, but what figure do you see that going up by? And I'm not putting you in the spot, uh -huh. but you know what you know my, my point. It's hard to for, for me the, 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 the way we've operated for a number of years is we, we have got a an idea for income for the year and we provide the number of the most trips we can accordingly and we have been turning away clients and we have been refusing trips so we're, we're not going to lift another 20,000 people and bust the organisation because we've done that so we, we, we're under pressure there to make sure the, the, we only spend what we've got and that restricts the travel we do and especially with the capacity in the vehicles we talked about if that's still reduced and the demand's higher we're, we're very, very concerned, not just that there's going to be people there need lifted and they can't get, and that might have knock-on health effects, but we spent nine months where our reputation has been enhanced no end, and within three months that reputation could be in the gutter. If we're, you, you guys will be getting phone calls saying, that crowd won't lift me, and then that doubt and about is a disaster. And, you know, because of, the, the capacity, because of our, our, our resource, we're going to have to turn away a lot of people, and that's going to be very difficult for us to manage, and you guys will hear about it, I'm sure. One, one final question on regarding the health work that you currently do. I know the case just outside Cookstown where a lady used to be lifted at the, by the ambulance bus, as I call it. Now you are doing that. So they are not doing it for whatever reason, but you can. So, and they're not, health service is not paying that cost. So have you knocked the door of the health service? Say that again. Sorry. Have you knocked the door of the health service basically to support you for the work? Because well, they have stopped doing their work because of COVID reasons. Uh -huh. I'm not talking about ambient, I'm just talking about minibus work, but okay. you are doing that work. Well, that non emergency yeah. um, um, ambulance expected. service has, has basically ground to a halt as well. So, what, what we're doing is, is we are providing, if anybody has an out of area hospital appointment, we do it at full cost recovery. I, same like the, the, the group. So, whatever it costs us to do that run so, if, and if we can get a volunteer to do it then it's obviously more cost effective for the so for the member back. and but we don't get that back that's just well we we get it back from the from the client and then or from the member and whether then the member can actually claim that as part of an expense a travel expense they may get some of that back but but generally it's the member that's footing the bill for that <laughs> For that out of area, where normally that would be provided through that that uh, ambulance service. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kimmins. Thanks, Chair, and, and thank you all um, for for the presentation. It's it's something I have a particular interest in, and I suppose others have touched on some of the points there. Um, I suppose, firstly, the the fact that that the services had in COVID during COVID, um, I suppose, is, has been invaluable. Um, you know, when we see things like day centres and um, and all those facilities that a lot of older people would have been accessing, particularly from rural areas, um, gr ground to a halt as well. Um, just to have that contact with the outside world and, and someone different, I think, is, is crucially important. So, you know, just to commend the work that, that you've all done and I suppose repurposing nearly um, in, in, in very difficult times. I just wanted to go back to the point there that um, that Keith had raised too in relation to the non-emergency uh, ambulance stuff, and I had mentioned this before in, in discussions with Tim, and that um, you know I, I worked in the trust before, I worked in older people services. One of the biggest difficulties that that we had was trying to arrange transport for appointments for um, you know if someone needed to go into a nursing home, those types of things. Onus generally can be put on family members or our friends, which is, isn't always feasible. And at, on occasions, they have had to take emergency ambulances out of action to try and, and fill those gaps. So even pre-COVID, this has been a massive issue. And, and it's certainly, in, I know in your in your presentation, you mentioned the bulk of your work is health-related transport. I think the fact that it's such a, a cross-cutting service, um, there really should be uh, discussions with the Department for Health on this and how, how they can help going forward. I think... One thing coming out of COVID that we've all realised is, is the impact of voluntary services and, and community groups and things like that, um, you know, in, in filling voids where statutory provision can't. Um, and I think it is further exposed that um, in, in a very, very different setting. So is has there been any discussions around that with Department for Health 
you know, either in the past or is that something we could look at going forward? We, we've, we've engaged with health individually. The department officials have engaged with health and, and previous ministers. We, we, we spoke to the minister a couple of months back on a, on a Zoom call, and that was one of the points we raised, and, and she had said she would uh, try and revisit that. But the, the, the problem is we, we've spent a lot of time having those discussions, outlining, uh, outlining what we can and can't do, and then over a period of time it just sort of drifts away and nothing mm. happens. You know, so it's not the case the question hasn't been asked. It's not the case that, that, that even at, at, at minister level, uh, DFI minister has approached health minister or uh, at that level. But uh, for us, the frustration for us is that, that we know we can do that work very well. Uh, th there's a statutory obligation on some of that transport, like, like transport to daycare is, is absolutely a, an obligation of the health, health trust to do that. But there's a lot of other sort of stuff that's hard to determine. Is that for them to do or is that for us to do? But the, the, and the other thing of the non-emergency ambulance uh, uh, transport services, People make bookings or they, the GP surgery sets somebody up for an appointment. They get them into the system and then they're getting phone calls maybe the day before to say, look, uh, we're too busy, we can't do that tomorrow. And people are being let down too late. When they ring us, we need them to be signed up as a member. We need three or four days' notice. Had we known a week before, we could have done it. But when they ring us today to say, oh, the ambulance service rang me and says they can't take me tomorrow, it's too late for us and we're letting them down too. So there could be better working together. But for me, I, I personally think as well, the, the, the transport within the ambulance service itself regionally, as well as the trusts locally, they're under serious pressure. We, again, with a bit of additional resource, could do a lot of that work for them. But we're banging our heads against a brick wall for that request, and we're ending up doing some of it anyway, mainly because of we care about people and we want to help people out. But that's unfair on our sector, that we're sort of picking up some of that slack and getting no recompense for it from that department. So it's, it's, a, it's been on the go for 10 years. It's been a problem for 10 years, and we've discussed it. We talk about it at community planning level and councils. It's raised when you're talking, you meet the trust, you meet the PHA. It's just washing about for years, and nothing's getting done, you know? Yeah, no, and I think, I think that's exactly the point, that it, there does not need to be better coordination on this, because certainly it's, it can complement the, the existing services that are in place. Um, and I think it would be a huge lift. Um, you know, to those, like you mentioned, the non-emergency ambulance and things like that here are under serious pressure. So, you know, it, 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 it makes perfect sense. It just, I suppose, needs a bit of tweaking so that people, you know, it, it's smooth and it, and it runs um, it, it runs well. But I certainly think it's something that should be explored. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know whether we, we can look into that further from an infrastructure, but I suppose as MLS, uh, we can be raising it with the Department for Health. The other, the other question just really is, and, and I know um, you've mentioned there at the minute, depending on, on levels of activity and how that will affect funding and things, but there had been some discussion around um, multi-year funding. So it's really just to kind of get a sense of what that would mean then for, for the transport for like yourselves or if, if you were able to avail of that. Yeah, in terms of multi-year funding, I think that's very important. The difficulty is that you know you're, you, it's very difficult to plan year to year. And it's also it's very difficult to plan uh, from a capital basis year to year because uh, you know a minibus typically has a, you know about a six year lifespan. You don't you don't want to be going beyond that. Uh, although right now uh, many of the RCTPs are being forced to go beyond that uh, uh, time frame for their capital expenditure because they don't have the funding, they don't have the um, the ability to plan over a two or three year period. So I think for the department, I think it would be better if they could you know make a commitment. Um, to a, to a three year funding model, and that would allow RCTPs to plan and to be able to, to bet more effectively um, adapt service to to be able to to utilise it where it's needed. And just on the health point, very quickly, we're not unique in that. There are examples across uh, Europe and across the United Kingdom and Ireland as well of where there's been innovative ways of transport to health as to how that's been tackled. And I think you know we we need to be looking at those innovative models, and we're not at the moment. Um, we're we're kind of of uh, very close to the idea of looking at innovative ways of getting passengers to and from hospital and you know even in and around issues of delayed discharge and that sort of thing community transport can play a role in that but we're, we're not there but there is innovation if we're prepared to look at it okay thank you yeah. no I, I agree with you and I think um, you know do sometimes we work very much in silos particularly in, in 
across departments. So that is, I think, if we if we looked outside the box a bit more and, and kind of worked more across departmentally, we might be able to solve a lot of the issues face, being faced. And um, the last one, I suppose, is just because obviously you have done a lot of repurposing in terms of the work that you're doing at the minute due to COVID. Um, and, and, and I know none of us really know how things are going to look in six months, twelve months' time. Um, you know, in, in terms of those kind of things that you are doing now with deliveries, and is that something that you think could have a lasting impact going forward as, as part of your service, or um, do you think it is just predominantly for, for this period? I think, I think the main reason why we were doing it was because we didn't have the, trans, the passenger transport to do, so we had the free resource. As, as the clients have come back on board from the summer, uh, we're, we're probably, with the restrictions we talked about in the vehicles and no car scheme, we're probably not far off full capacity. I, mean, we're, I know we're delivering about a third of the trips we delivered last September, October, November. Um, so it, it's, 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 it was just the fact that we, we had the space and the resource to do it back then. We're doing a bit of it now as and when we can, but our priority would be the passenger transport. And when we're up to full capacity with passenger transport, it really limits what we can do for the wider community. Okay. Thank you. I have four, okay. I have four, mem I have four members to ask questions, and I've got 10 minutes to get through. So, um, Mr. Hildage, Deputy Chair. Thanks, Chair. Chair, you're under pressure there. Uh, could I just congratulate you for the work that you have been doing and, and thank all your volunteers there for everything that's done in the last Absolutely outstanding. Um, just on the, you mentioned regulatory divergence between the NI and UK. Uh, in the report, is that basically around section 22? Is that, or is there other issues there? Well, it's very difficult to compare us with GB because they have obviously they fully deregulated their bus market and now they've partially regulated it again. So we we have a a very different um, uh, regulatory regime. Uh, there's also differences that have emerged between here and there, not because we have different regulation or different legislation. The legislation and regulation are identical, but um, at the time when this House stood in suspension, our civil servants took decisions that were probably to the detriment of community transport, where um, ministers who were in place and when politicians were in charge in England, Scotland and Wales, those decisions were different. Um, would have been more to the benefit of the bus market being uh, more f liberally regulated or freely interpreted in terms of the regulation. I think if anybody's going to do a dissertation on why politicians are needed, they could look at the difference between Northern Ireland and, and GB and how they and the approaches of civil servants and the approaches of ministers and politicians towards regulation. I think you know you can clearly see that when there's ministers and politicians that there's better outcomes uh, than when civil servants are, are left to do that. Uh, obviously civil servants are great. But um, <laughs> so so yeah, so I think that there's a lot of issues that we have um, that are legacy issues of how regulation has been interpreted. And I think there's also um, issues that we've got because our bus market is highly regulated. And I think that what we need to look at is an approach of not deregulation of the bus market. I think that would be wrong. But I think we need to look at ways of, of innovative solutions and, and innovative ways to regulate. Okay. And uh, because of the work that you're doing in the communities and local government being focused on community planning, has there been any help or resource from the local councils, local government level? I know we spoke a lot about central government here. But. Well, we have actually engaged with our the Mid Ulster Council and um, Bridget and myself from from CDM. We're sitting on a, an integrated transport sort of forum, but um, and that came out because um, the community plan there really was no provision in the in that Mid Ulster community plan. It said it talked about an integrated transport pilot, which has since disappeared and um, so we have um, been talking but we haven't met in, since since the start of the year so that's something that, that in all, we in all the community up. plans rural transport references somewhere along the way it's either uh, maybe a, it's mentioned in passing or it's a significant like I know in Fermanagh and Owen places like that it's a really big one but there's no formal agreement there or no sort of sense that the councils are going to fork out big money to, to tap into it. They, they're, they're raising it as an issue, and then they're saying to DFA, what are you doing with this? Uh, through, the, through the community plan and structure. They have lots of money, don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll cut that. that Brilliant. Thing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr Beggs? Uh, again, but I actually think, thanks to you and your members for what you've been doing during this period when many people have been isolated. Um, 
But you've mentioned that um, your, your, your buses um, could pick up a member but couldn't stop to pick up a non-member. Becoming a member, how complicated is that just filling a form in? What, what needs done? It's filling in a form. It's, it's filling in an application form and having it rubber stamped at the other, at the other end. That's it. And as long as you tick the box that... Um, that, and, and our membership is, is right across. You don't have to be a particular age or, or anything like that. If you do not have access to um, transport and you can't access, you know, like a, or, or say you had to walk a mile to the nearest bus stop or two miles, then you are eligible to join our, our uh, membership scheme. So, and, and, and do you develop? Um, regular routes to a degree where you know everybody's from a certain area is going to a, a day centre on a certain day or something like that. Do you, do you develop regular routes? We would have shopping routes. They're not regular because we're not permitted under the under the permit. But what we do is we would have maybe sort of ten people in one area, and Maggie might go this week, and Jenny might go the next week, and yeah. and. And we snake around, say, if we're talking about Balahi area, and we bring them into into Macrofelt to do the shopping, or we go out to Kern, or we go to Macrofelt uh, or Mahara. So those are the types of things. And maybe a Tuesday's a shopping day, and a Friday's a shopping day, um, and then we would have other sort of runs that that we do. But but they're not they're not timetabled, and they're not publicised, and they're not. Not widely. But you're not doing random pickups. You're, you're We're not to doing. Run, you're no, to everybody's ringing in to say that okay. that they need transport. And how would your costs compare with the, the, your charges that you put to individuals compared to those that if they were getting the local bus service? Well, our our if service. It were there, of course. Generally, most of our our people are getting free because you know a good ninety percent of of our out and about members have the smart pass, so they're either getting free travel or they're getting half fare travel through the the DERA, the smart pass um, scheme. So from that point of view, it's very very affordable, and and they're getting picked up at the front door. They're not getting. They don't have to walk to the end of the lane, or they don't have to walk to the end of the road. So. Um, but in terms of if a passenger was paying, if you travelled between not and five miles, it's three pounds fifty for a single journey. So that would be it. So a return journey seven pounds within a five mile kind of radius of of their their home. And that tapers up then every a pound, pound. five to ten mm -hmm. miles, ten to fifteen miles. So the further you travel, the more you pay. But it, it's still heavily subsidised, and they're paying, you know, three, four, five pound each way into the local town. And just finally, for each other's maybe one. And um, in terms of your volunteers, are your volunteers still coming forward? You know, because in a day that must be a difficult issue as well. It's, it's essential that people do come forward and help. But are they still coming forward? We do have. Um, we had 18 volunteers before um, before this this happened, and um, currently we have six who are are providing service for us at the minute. So. Um, the other ones, because of health issues or family members or, or other things, um, have said, look, we'll, we, we're not comfortable for now. So we have lost a lot of our volunteer base, but at the same time, the demand for, for passenger, you know, we, we have our, our paid drivers and the minibuses, and, and those are our costs that, that we meet every month. So we try to get as much in the in the buses as we can um, and, and utilise them fully over the course of the, the week. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. And um, I will be brief because I'm just conscious of time, but I would like to, to thank uh, for all the work that's been done by Community Transport in Northern Ireland, particularly during the pandemic and the information that was provided today was really valuable. I'd also declare that I was previously an employee of TransLink. Just one brief question. Um, obviously, uh, DVA centres and their facilities have been curtailed or not stopped as a result of the pandemic. I'd just be interested to know the impact that's had upon community transport in Northern Ireland. Just for vehicle testing, we, we are, we're like every other vehicle and commercial vehicles, we're, we're getting letters out to say it's, you know, we give an extension of six months, or I think there might have been a second letter. So we, we, our vehicles are no different to the rest. That, that, um, we're, we're being given extensions on the on the MOT or PSV check, but I can assure you, our, our vehicles are the best maintained vehicles in the country. We we do ten weekly inspections. We we, we, we meet the criteria 
of the highest level there for uh, commercial vehicles and big buses and lorries uh, voluntarily. So, so our, our vehicle checking and our maintenance regime is, uh, I would be very content to say, it's, it's absolutely top drawer. So, there, so there's no issue with vehicle safety. Um, but like every other vehicle, where there's a backlog there on testing. And just in relation to the practical and the theory tests and that other element of DVA services, has that had an impact? Again, from my point of view, we reviewed our driver's licences and who's, you know, there's a five year cycle there for the CPC and you have to have your courses done. So but we, we've looked and we don't personally have any drivers that are needing a test or a license to gain in, in a short period of time. So we're hoping that come springtime, we can get caught up. We've kind of missed a year there of CPC courses, so uh, it'll not be that difficult for us to get up to speed with that again. And so, I, I, again, I'd be content that... Uh, on, uh, and again, I think anybody whose licence is expiring or has expired in the last six months or due to expire, I think they're getting temporary uh, extensions as well. So, again, we're keeping abreast of that, uh, but, we, again, we, we don't think uh, it's, it's going to cause us any major concerns. Thank you very much, Chair. There's another question around Section 22, but I'll engage with them directly on that. So, okay, thank you, Mr. Boylan. Thanks, Chair. And thank you very much. It was enlightening. You, you brought the local stuff right up into the committee here, and well, I don't know a bit of voluntary stuff myself. So, no, and the people will appreciate it. I'm going to get time to reflect on this in 12 months' time. Those people out there, they just just helped out. Just one, two points because I want to talk about the Section 22. Just a question, but see, in terms of um, you said about relaxation of the permit. What exactly can you outline the wee bit? So, of so what they, I, again, it was a, a non-member. So, whenever we transport anybody, when we transport anybody on our vehicle, they must be a member of our of our organisation. So then, the relaxation was that if we had, say, we had people who still had to get to hospital appointments or still had to get to medical appointments, even though um, there was a a shortage of, of, of doctors seeing, seeing people, but if they still needed to go and they were a non-member of Out and About Community Transport, we could st then, under the relaxation, we could have taken them um, as, as no, part and, of... And the only reason I ask the question is because I think we have to learn from this example of what we could do, mm -hmm. what's out there. Absolutely. You know what I mean, in terms of the model and everything. Mm -hmm. But I'll leave that down. you got the follow issues sorted out, yeah? That was brilliant. I mean, again, th th I think that was the lifesaver. The, the, the arts money from DERA that we panicked about, and then there was a question mark about whether we, we were getting direction from the department very early on that we couldn't avail a furlough. But that was the, from, I think that was an assumption from those officials that we were getting 100% funding from the department and didn't understand that model of three or four pots making up the big pot. So, and again, no, I, I would be very clear as well that no organisation was taking advantage of that. We, we had a couple of older drivers who were shielding themselves, so absolutely ideal for the furlough scheme, and a couple of others who had partners who were shielding. So of 15 drivers, we had four drivers furloughed, so we weren't taking the hand there and, and, and over, overcooking it. Yeah. Uh, but but that, that, that four wages covered for them nine months, it's running into 30 odd thousand pounds. For, that's a big, big reason why we're saying today, this year we're OK, but next year yeah. is our problem. Just quickly in the section I do, because surely COVID, we've learned from COVID and reinforces there's an opportunity here. Uh, some of the challenges, can you outline maybe some of the challenges we had if we were to go down that route? I mean, or so some of the, the challenges of, sec of section yeah. 22. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, look, obviously, I mean, section 22 is not going to be a, a panacea, um, it's not going to solve all of our problems. It, I, I think. The challenge is how can we innovatively develop the bus market to meet uh, as much need as, as is possible to meet. And I think you know it's not about community transport v TransLink v commercial operators. I think there's space for everybody to operate in. Uh, and I think the, the the challenge that we've got here is I think it was Liz mentioned it earlier is a silo mentality that seems to just pervade every section of, of public service uh, in this part of the world. You know, we need to get out of this silo mentality that you know TransLink provide this type of service and uh, commercial operators provide this type of service and community transport provides this. There's some great examples uh, in other places of how they've innovatively uh, been able to have the public transport network work with community transport, work with commercial operators to build capacity, um, to be able to um, utilise that capacity. But I think the challenge we've got is we've got to start thinking differently. Everywhere else is thinking differently about how passenger transport's delivered, how demand responsive transport's delivered. 
and how those two uh, transport types, how they, how they marry up together. We're not thinking innovatively of, on that here. We're still in this, this idea that you know, TransLink is the first port of call for members of the public to be transported for a fare. You know, across Europe, across GB, down south, that's not how they're thinking. Uh, and, and they're coming up with different sort of demand responsive door-to-door -door, um, solutions that fit in with the, the, the public transport network. And, and if, until we start to look at that, um, you know, I think we're always we're always going to have challenges. So what we would like to see happen is that those those silos are broken down, and that we can all work together. There's room for commercial operators. There's there, there's room to help Translink and work with Translink, and for Translink to take the lead in that. And then there's room for community transport as well to do what we all do best. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Um, can I thank you all for coming this morning? Can I thank you for your presentation? There are a number of issues which you've highlighted which we're happy to explore and to take forward as well to support you on. So, um, and hopefully we'll, we'll see you at the end of all of this and, and at some stage perhaps we might get the opportunity to, to visit. Yeah. Um, well, well, thank you, Chair, and thanks to the members of the committee because we, we do feel very supported um, by, by all of you and, and, and for the time that you've taken even on the furlough issue. I you know many of you wrote the department on our behalf and that was really valuable and really vital for us. So thank you very much for your support as well. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, members, just a couple of things just to finish off before we, we go. And if you could just hold on the line just after the adjournment as well, just for 30, for 30 seconds. Um, on the back of this, members are content that we write to the minister just um, highlighting some of the issues here, particularly around budget. Um, looking around um, maybe COVID support um, to see them through this this, this particular time, issues around um, Section 22, but also um, the discussions that um, the, the Infrastructure Minister has had um, with both Health and DFC. And if members are content that perhaps we write to both of those committees, both Health and Communities, yep. just um, and perhaps forward the, the piece of work that they have sent to us. Um, sort of highlighting the work that they've done during this particular time um, and to see if they can add any pressure to those departments as well to, to assist in this. Okay, you can tend to do that. Okay, moving then to draft for war programme um, and we have that there at the schedule of briefings until Christmas recess. Um, unfortunately, the department have advised that um, DVA, who were to come up to brief us on the 16th of December, will be unable to attend. Um, and said that we can reschedule that then to January. Um, they will um, be coming to the department. Will send some officials to brief us on the common frameworks um, on that date instead. So really, the questions that we're going to submit to them today are probably are, are quite timely. Um, is there any other business? No. Um, uh, I... Chair, oh. chair. Just to clarify, what uh, the actions have been in relation to taxis? Obviously, we're. My understanding and recollection, I'm a bit tired, so forgive me on this. Uh, the recollection is we're going to seek a meeting with yeah. the uh, Infrastructure Committee and representatives of um, taxi yeah. uh, drivers and organisations. That, so that's, that, that's my one understanding. I just want to see if there's anything else that we've agreed in relation to that issue of support for taxi drivers. We've also agreed to, to make contact with um, the department just in relation to... Um, what are we insurance ask? holidays. Sorry, insur we're... yeah, insurance criteria because yeah. we obviously we've we're going to get some information from the audit office in relation to that um, aspect of it, um, and we're going to write to the three departments: communities, infrastructure, and economy, just relating up to the assistance schemes. And um, I think there's going to be. I obviously give you an update just in, in the interim um, information that we got through from the DALO. Um, around um, the criteria, and obviously that is legislative, although the closing date is administrative. So we got that information in the meeting. Um, so if you're content, I'm going to going to speak about this actually after the meeting concludes. If you're content to hold on. No, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sort of clarify that, what we had agreed. That was agreed that we were going to yeah. to do that. Okay. Um, so always maintain social distancing as you leave. Um, the next meeting is at 9:30, and that's next Wednesday. And it's in room 29, and that brief, uh, we're going to have a briefing from um, officials on flood management plans, reservoirs, and um, RAIS are going to be briefing us on business models within the UK and ROI water sector and electric vehicle waste. And we're also going to be receiving a briefing from Belfast International Airport. Um, but it's just, again, to be mindful that we're going to be finishing at 12, so I think we're just going to have to be very focused and, and watch your time for that meeting. So if members are content, we'll adjourn.
this is the Northern Ireland Assembly.